This event is promoted by Science for Democracy, an international platform founded by 10 Italians. Claudia is one of them. Claudio Radaelli, who will be speaking later on in the panel, is another one, and Marco Capato, who will be closing today's event, is one of the others. We decided to promote something that has two crucial names for today's public affairs, science on the one hand and democracy, because not always they talk to each other or if one talks, the other doesn't listen, or if the other one listens, they don't want to hear what the other guys are saying. So the main focus of the work of Science for Democracy for the last 12 months has been to try and promote a dialogue between the community and decision makers. Decision makers are not only or not necessarily only members of parliament and we're happy to have one uh, here today. They'll be giving uh, the keynote speech later. Um, but can also be judges, can be courts, can be a lot of other institutions that have to do with decisions that, I don't know what is your sense of what democracy is or should be, are certainly part of the a more general theme of the rule of law. The title of today is Science for the Environment, Knowledge and Action, because we wanted to put together two additional aspects, not only science in general and politics or politicians in general, but the, a, a wider uh, concept of knowledge which may go also beyond science in, in terms of hard science or anything that is formally recognized as science and action because it's important to have people taking up their responsibilities to promote ideas or proposals for reforms or little suggestions for both science, democracy, and decision makers in general to address specific issues. We, the environment is in the title, the environment will be discussed today in a panel discussion, but we will also have a session entirely dedicated to the new instruments, new so to speak, it's 10 years, I was a senator in Italy 10 years ago when the International European Citizens Initiative was launched and I, I was the rapporteur um, in the the Senate in Rome to brief my colleagues of what this idea was. Nobody understood it and it's not a, a, a surprise that, that not many Italian European initiatives have been launched over the last few years. This time around we have been able to, to close that gap and we are dealing with in particular Science for Democracy in addition with others, the European movement, other environmentalist groups on carbon pricing and that uh, in the room we also have other representatives from other themes that have to do with the environment, that have to do with biotechnologies, and have to do with activating uh, rights at the European level. Science for Democracy is also working, and with this I will conclude my welcoming remarks, on something that is not existing with the name that I will mention now, but has been around with us for at least 50 years, which is the right of and the right to science. While we're having our panel today, the, U the United Nations is discussing a document that it's called General Comment on Article 15 on the, of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that deals with science in three ways. The first is the freedom for scientists, for researchers to do their work, regardless of the topic that they're addressing. It could be the most ethically sensible, they have to do it. They have to research and then produce evidence that needs to be faced with other evidence, possibly the contrary, it has to be falsified, it has to be duplicated in the way in which scientists work. The second important element is the promotion of scientific culture, which is if you want the sister, older sister, younger sister of freedom of speech. This evidence needs to circulate, needs to circulate around the world to engage people and promote the need to at least have evidence-based debates so that we know what we're talking about and we have a more ammunition to take a decision. The last and possibly more universally important aspect of this right is the right for everyone to benefit from the latest scientific discoveries. So if something is recognized as a therapy in a part of the world that has enough money to produce the necessary treatment, it needs to be available or it has to be available on the other side of the world. So limitations, prohibitions, especially those that are born out of ideology, philosophy, religion, 
or dogmas should not be part of the public debate because if they are in, in fact part of the public debate are a violation of a human right. The United Nations at the end of uh, October will publish this general comment which is going to be a, a, possibly a 20 page document in which all aspects uh, related to science are going to be there from traditional knowledge to the latest biotechnologies they have to be studied and they have to become the guidelines of how member states will go and explain to the United Nations how they're respecting human rights. The other aspect that we've been following, and with this, we'll, uh, I'll give the floor to our uh, host, in fact, and guest at the same time, um, how Europe is actually facing this very quick development of science. Europe the European Parliament and the Commission have adopted a new framework program that's called Horizon Europe that is setting um, aside 100 billion euros for the next six years, from 2021 to 2027. And the most contentious parts of research, genome editing on animals, humans, and plants, is not included as one of the key priority for Europe. We know that at the same time, this is not, 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 not a priority, it's a reality in the United States and China. So once again, Europe is risking to keep, be left behind this exercise. And we believe that once this right of science or to science is known, uh, there will be ways to go to the European decision makers and inform them about that it may be or become uh, a violation of human rights. This is what uh, the way in which I would like to welcome you today to this event. There will be an opportunity to hear, but there will also be an opportunity to speak. So we'll try to make uh, everything uh, within the framework of, of our time, and we will have a coffee break in between. I'll, it's a pleasure to invite now Tom von der Leyen, von der Lee. I'm sorry, I don't know, with the product, pronunciation in Dutch, it's a little rusty. So who's a a member of, of, of the House of Representatives from the Green Party, and uh, we asked him to tell us about what happened in the Netherlands with some of the issues that will be, be discussed later on. You have the floor. Thank you very much for your introduction, and it's an honor to be here and also to see a relatively long, young and diverse uh, public. Um, I would like to, to share uh, a bit about the Dutch culture and the role science uh, has played for many years and is still playing in our society as a driver for change, but also in many ways as a referee in policy making, but also in the way we uh, run our democracy. Um, as you are probably aware, we've fought together as a society against the water for centuries. And we have a very diverse background in the sense that we have a lot of cultural, religious, political differences, but we needed uh, to cross these differences to co collaborate. Um, and uh, this culture, the, the Paul the model, we, we call it, um, is still something that's very uh, characteristic of the way we work in the Netherlands. Uh, and this also has implications for the role science plays, places in our society. Because to overcome differences, we sometimes need objective information, evidence-based um, information, but also referees in deciding um, who is right in terms of the facts, and also um, to decide whether the expectations we have of certain policies are scientifically founded or not. Um, just last week, uh, the Nobel Prize for Economics was awarded to Esther Duflo, which I think was very great because he's the youngest recipient, but also have done some, yeah, profound research, uh, field research in terms of uh, poverty um, reduction. Um, but the first winner of the Nobel Prize for Economics was a Dutchman, Jan Timberger. And he was also the founder of the Dutch Central Planning Bureau. Um, and this is one of the ex scientific examples we have in the Netherlands, uh, in which we used science to build models to also test uh, our policies, uh, which also plays a very important role in our politics. 
Uh, we have many parties currently uh, in uh, the second chamber, of which I am a member. We have 150 members, but 15 different parliamentary groups. There's a very low threshold. You can enter po politics quite easily. But we have traditions like parties, most of them, um, present a party program for the next four years, but deliver it to the Central Planning Bureau. And the Bureau uses its models to look at what will the implications be of the policies proposed, uh, both in social economic impact, but more and more also in our environmental um, impact. Yeah, because next to the Central Planning Bureau, we also have a specific bureau which looks at uh, environment, environmental issues and a separate one that looks at uh, public health and hygiene. Um, so science and also models based on science combined with uh, measurements from sensory networks, but even more and more also from uh, satellites. Huh? Uh, Toproni, we have there are different satellites now uh, which are capable of measuring very precisely all kinds of emissions, for instance. All this scientific information plays a very important role uh, in our uh, democracy. Uh, and maybe focusing on the area of uh, environment, I think it's good for you probably to know that where science um, and, and scientific developments are a huge driver for change. If you look at all the developments in CRISPR-Cas, uh, it was just mentioned, for instance, but also nanotechnology, photonica, quantum mechanics, biotechnology, uh, you see the Dutch uh, economy is very knowledge-driven. Um, currently, we are the most competitive economy in Europe. We even surpassed uh, Switzerland. But if you look at how we did that, we are also uh, one of the most, um, um, let's say, uh, um, economy which, yeah, let's say, that, yeah, transfers of, no, sorry, I'm struggling with my English, which is uh, facing issues in terms of the planetary boundaries. So per capita, we emit the most uh, carbon equivalents. We also are by far the biggest producer of nitrogen and we have the most intensive agriculture in the world. We are the second agricultural producer in the world. We have a very small country, um, but we uh, abuse nature. Um, uh, we have traditionally been the hub, the, the port for Europe. We have uh, uh, several big industrial clusters with a lot of chemical uh, steel producing companies that also emit a lot of uh, CO2 equivalents. Um, what we are trying to do now is uh, uh, try and change our policies in such a way that we can compete with our neighbors also in terms of protecting the environment because we are in the bottom if you look at the amount of renewable energies. Uh, we are the country with the least biodiversity in uh, Europe. Um, and this means that we have to transform our economy in a huge way. And we need, desperately need science. Um, but it also means that everybody has to change his or her life here in, in the Netherlands, uh, which meant that the last two years, for instance, we succeeded in adopting a climate law, which is quite exceptional, given our tradition. Um, it was an initiative from opposition parties, but eventually was supported by 80% of the seats in Parliament. We also, through a very complicated process in the Polder model, to come up with a climate agreement in which quite a number of measures are being proposed to uh, reduce, for instance, carbon equivalent emissions with 49% in 2030 and 95% in 2050. But this means huge changes in our society and it has become a very um, politicized uh, issue. Uh, we also have populist parties, um, which, yeah, of course, are very yeah, vehemently uh, attacking not only uh, the mainstream and green and left parties, but also science as such. More and more we now have a situation in which our renowned institutions are also being attacked. Uh, the models are being attacked. 
And you see that because populist right-wing parties are doing this, mainstream parties, and we traditionally are a centrist right-wing country, are also affected with this virus. Uh, we have huge demonstrations uh, this week and uh, the week before because of the nitrogen issue uh, and farmers using their tractors uh, with uh, hundreds of tractors uh, visiting here uh, The Hague uh, because they have to change the way they produce and a lot of them probably need to stop farming because the level of nitrogen is so high that currently we cannot build new buildings and houses in the Netherlands. We cannot even build new windmill parks on land because of the nitrogen issue. Um, uh, so we, we live in a yeah, very fascinating time in which uh, science, uh, or the role of science is more and more important, but it also loses uh, somewhat the position it had as a referee in terms of uh, um, bridging the political differences we have in our society. Um, and a lot of these issues, especially dealing with environment, are per definition uh, not national, but global issues. Uh, and that's why multilateralism is crucial in solving uh, these issues. And we in the Netherlands uh, can benefit from the work that's been done by science globally, but also what the European Union is doing and agreeing in terms of specific directives. I and mean, if you look at, at uh, and I am a policy maker, um, uh, we have three types of instruments. And that's, uh, I'm thinking about my closing remarks probably, I'm not sure about the time, but you know, we can use uh, all kinds of regulations to force change. We can go, yeah, give uh, financial, uh, let's say, carrot and sticks measures. Eh? You can stimulate or uh, you can fine. Uh, but I think in the term, if you look at science and environment, what's crucial is that the instrument of, for instance, carbon pricing of nit or nitrogen uh, pricing is something that can be very effective. It's the most fair way to bring uh, the external costs of the way we did things into the price of products. Uh, it also um, makes it possible uh, to maximize innovation uh, without uh, a whole lot of bureaucracy. Um, uh, so one of the reasons, apart from the environmental uh, ambitions we have, I think carbon pricing is in many ways a very effective uh, instrument. And of course we have the emission trading system uh, in Europe, which is becoming more and more effective because uh, the cost of uh, uh, one ton of carbon is rising. Uh, part of the climate agreement in the Netherlands is introducing two new types of carbon pricing. One is a minimum price for uh, the electricity sector, but within the ETS system. But next to that, and that's kind of a hybrid system we are now developing, is a specific carbon tax for our industry. Um, uh, and uh, this has been very contested because our industry is competing not only in Europe but on a global level. It's uh, very afraid of, uh, of the, the fact that we might create an unbalanced uh, playing field instead of a, a level playing field. But we feel here in the Netherlands and we hope uh, that we can uh, yeah, get support from other European countries that using the instrument of carbon pricing can be the most effective way to reach and increase Europe's ambition uh, to address climate change. And this will also mean that we not only uh, price uh, yeah, carbon within the Union, but we also have to look at the European border. Uh, and uh, then we have a discussion also on taxing import into Europe if it comes from countries where yeah, there is no carbon price. Um, and this is something, uh, maybe uh, some of you are, are, are active in that field, but one of the big questions we are facing is how do we operate, yeah, make, make instruments like carbon pricing, pricing effective? Uh, within the current system of the ETS, uh, we, uh, you have European countries with a national emission authority, but they are, are only uh, aware and knowledgeable, and they do measure uh, the emissions within 
specific industrial installations, that the big industry and the big uh, power plants. But we need to have far more information about the carbon footprint of almost every project if we are able uh, to create uh, effective carbon pricing instruments. And that's also, I think, one of the huge tasks for science. Um, otherwise, we as policymaker have to look for uh, second best alternatives. And that is regulations, very detailed laws, which always have a time lag and are not, are not always effective. Or we have to spend an awful lot of money to reach results that can be far more effectively uh, uh, created by uh, pricing instruments. Um, and of course, this is all contested. I'm talking from a Green Party perspective, uh, and all the parties have a different uh, perspective. But given the fact that we are so far behind, also uh, compared to our European peers, um, we as Dutch have to take big, bold steps. And that's difficult for us, given the way our society uh, has grown uh, and, and the, the polder model we have. We make very little steps, uh, very complicated compromises, but we need big, bold steps. And these big, bold steps, I think, can be brought uh, by using uh, science and uh, even more in, in our society. And I, there are many other things I could talk about, but I think I'm, I'm probably uh, um, at the end of one minute. Um, so what I think is also maybe important to mention is that apart from science, uh, we also face a big economic imbalance in Europe. Uh, the, the North, especially Germany and the Netherlands, doesn't invest enough in its own and its, in the European economy. And the Dutch uh, uh, have, is, are, is, are the only substantial economy in the European Union with a public debt below 50%. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I'm looking at you, Italy, it's, I think, uh, currently 120%. Uh, and we have a surplus on our, on our budget. We have a, a, a system, a pension system, which uh, has built up a wealth of 1,500 billion euros and 1,300 billion is invested outside the Netherlands, most of it even outside Europe. Um, and luckily, we, we now see also within Europe big ambitions, uh, also in, in, in terms of the Green Deal. And what we need, for instance, is uh, a hydrogen project on a European scale. We in the North need hydrogen to uh, adapt our industry. We do not have the, the surface area, although we are building uh, windmills in the sea now, to produce enough renewable energy. But the south of Europe has this capacity. And if we uh, work together, we can create economic perspec uh, perspectives uh, um, and uh, ways of creating added value in the south of Europe while simultaneously solving huge environmental, environmental issues in the north. So these are also things, I think, we can benefit from each other and which also um, solves some very big uh, instability within, for instance, the Eurozone. Uh, we have the largest trade surplus in the world currently. 11.2% of our economy we earn from other countries. And we are, every year we are above 10%. Uh, and countries in the south do not benefit from selling stuff to us. So these balances have to be addressed, both from a financial and economic perspective, but definitely also from an ecological perspective. So that's, I think, also a point I would like to make. That's it for now. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. And this is why we need a European politics, so not only national politics. Claudia Basta, who I think decided to move to the Netherlands 10 years ago, so she speaks more Dutch than Italian, I would say. No, I'm kidding. Who will be chairing the next panel. Uh, the the uh, carbon pricing is one of the ECI that it can be signed outside. We don't uh, certify the quality of coffee. I uh, apologize, but because the Italians are a little picky about certain black uh, drinks. But there's going to be a, a coffee break where you can sign that ECI and many others. You can also help uh, support Science for Democracy. There's some goodies for you, but now we go into the next panel discussion. Claudia, to you. Thank you. 
Welcome, everybody. Um, I would start with an undead talk that maybe is helping me to break the ice, especially from my own side. And it is that over lunch, I was saying to the people who helped organize uh, this event today that despite having been in the Netherlands 15 years, precisely, and having come here for my studies, um, and having become a researcher in the meantime, so being extremely well used to attend the seminars, organize roundtables, moderate panels, and etc. Yesterday I was feeling a bit nervous about the idea of today, and I was wondering why. Um, and I think the reason is the following. It is the first time that I am in a situation in which I am moderating a panel in an event that has been organized entirely by volunteers, uh, whether scientists or activists, and it really feels different uh, when you are on the side of someone who has really injected time and energies out of your academic network or official associations to just do something that matters to you and to the people who share your initiatives with you. So I want to thank everybody who, is, who has uh, contributed to making today possible and starting from the audience who is with us today. Um, my role for today will just be acting as the ho local host of uh, Science for Democracy, and so I pass to invite uh, the uh, panel members. First, I start with excusing one of the panel members who was invited, was Professor Claire Dunlow from uh, the University of Exeter. Uh, personal circumstances prevented her from uh, being here today with us. Um, but we have a rich panel nevertheless, so I start with inviting Catherine Rittig, Assistant Professor of International Politics at Newcastle uh, University. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> then I invite uh, Professor Duncan Russell, uh, Professor of Environmental Policy at the University of Exeter. Uh, professor Edwin Zakai, Professor of Sustainable Development at Free University Brussels. <laughs> and finally, I would like to invite Professor Claudio Radaelli, who is Professor of Public Policy at University College London. Um, and another important affiliation of Professor Radaelli is that he is our chief scientist, so he's being among the co-founders of Science for Democracy from the beginning. And the seminar that we're having today follows up from a first seminar that was organized and moderated by him at UCL in the spring. So this is the second appointment of what we envision as a series of appointments on the topic of the relationship between science and policy. Um, I have the luck of coming after the keynote speech, uh, who mentioned already the episode that I want to mention from uh, launching the conversations with our panel members. And it is this, uh, in these very days, uh, the whole Netherlands is discussing about the nitrogen soil contamination issue, which has led thousands, three thousands to be precise, <laughs> tractors to travel through this city from the 12 provinces, so from all over the Netherlands, and to basically block the entire city for one day. I personally had to remain at home, uh, not being able to go to work, a lot of chaos and paralysis all over the city. Because of these farmers claim that the science behind the calculations and models that have informed the new regulation on nitrogen emissions are in fact killing their sectors and are not compatible with the rights to continue doing the work they have always done. So the whole country is speaking about this in this very moment, and I think it is the perfect background to discuss about what we want to discuss today, which is the difficult dialogue between science and the policy that science is meant to inform. So I would like to invite each of you to spend a few minutes to say what is in your experience, in your academic and scientific background experience, what is the biggest challenge that science faces today in the relationship with policy and society? Shall I start? Okay. <laughs> so, well, the biggest challenge that's underlying the use of scientific evidence is that it's increasingly being politicized and used to essentially further pre-existing political agendas. So we can overall differentiate three uses of scientific knowledge by policymakers and society, instrumental use, learning use, and political use. 
And the instrumental use, that's when users of scientific knowledge take the scientific findings as facts at face value and understand them as independent truth. A good example of that is essentially when you look at Greta Thunberg's recent speeches and statements, for her, climate change is a fact. And she's very confused by anyone doubting that. So it is really something that exists and it's nothing to be questioned. And this kind of instruments, instrumental use also means that scientific findings are interpreted as a reason to act by the users of knowledge as science has identified a political or a particular problem and this really requires a solution. So this is where policy and policy makers come in. And my research on the use of scientific knowledge in the climate change negotiations of the United Nations has shown that especially civil servants take scientific findings such as those by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at such face value and as the basis for drawing up policy proposals and legislation. So this instru instrumental use is essentially what we would hope or expect to be the normal case that contains an underpinning positivist worldview. Related to that is the learning use of, of scientific knowledge. That's similar, but it's also essentially people talking about it, discussing it, reflecting on it, and by that, essentially entering into a dialogue within society, the academics, scientists, together with the users of the knowledge, also discussing social underpinning values, and with that, trying to find a balance, a solution, which ends up in kind of a win-win perspective where we can both address, well, in the example, the needs of the farmers, but also the need that well, we need to maintain the land and the soil for the coming generations. Unfortunately, the current political climate and media debate is not so conducive to such a learning use of scientific knowledge, and it would rather require a cross-party political consensus and a depoliticization of the issues where scientific findings point towards a certain path of action. So a good example of that was in the United Kingdom in the late 2000s of the Labour government, and also the Conservatives both being very concerned about climate change, having an overall well, political consensus that it needs to be addressed. It was depoliticized, which also facilitated the 2008 Climate Change Act, which at that time was quite an advance in terms of climate legislation. So moving on to our current problem, that's the political use of scientific knowledge. And this is really what's currently the biggest challenge. So it means that science is essentially given the same status in the political and media debate than personal opinion, and which is not underpinned by or even contradicting scientific facts. So it's pretty similar to claiming the world is flat and the sun is revolving around it. And this often happens when certain interest groups, in the case of climate change, the fossil fuel industry, identify new scientific knowledge as an often existential threat to achieving and furthering their own interests, be it financial, political power or control, and then they're using any means and tactics necessary available to them to um, essentially frequently repeating their claims to build up a measure of legitimacy by using the media. So this political really indicates that science is becoming a convenient means of lending credibility to one's pre-existing power interest, if it matches the group's interests, but often it's contradicting that. And then it's really about discrediting science, scientists, academics, to cast doubt on the science as just another opinion. And this is where it gets really difficult in the sense that actors create a level of playing field between their own opinions and the political interests and the contradicting science. And in the end, when we're looking at what's happening across, well, first the United States and then Europe, it's also certain individuals in the background, often political advisors supporting um, political candidates who then move into power and then especially around um, the interest of contradicting climate change. We've seen that in the United States and now it's also happening in Europe where, for example, the um, alternative for Germany is now picking up climate change as the third big topic to cast out and essentially fish for 
disenfranchised voters' interests to gain political momentum. First it was the Eurozone crisis, then it was the migration crisis, and now they're finding a new topic on climate change. So the greatest challenge for the sciences is really in terms of policy and social dialogues is that we have entered a time of post-truth politics. And it really means that political parties, politicians, and interest groups have moved away from taking science at its face value, but instead framing it and understanding it as just another opinion. And this puts scientists at a disadvantage in the societal and media debate because their findings are being crowded out and discredited by the noise and attacks of often post-positivist framings to it. Yeah, as we could see by the farmers <laughs> discrediting everything that the Institute of National Health has basically produced. But maybe this will come up in one of the uh, following uh, contributions. Also, there is always the role of uncertainty and the interpretations that we give of the notions of uncertainty that really plays a big role. Um, well, I don't like to give the word to anybody specifically, so whoever of you wants to volunteer for giving the next contribution. Um, uh, hello, can you hear me? I've got a slight bad throat, so apologies if it's uh, not traveling. My voice isn't traveling across so well. Um, I think my, my take on this is uh, I, from someone who's been researching um, science and policy interactions uh, on both biodiversity policy and climate policy. I think I'm not going to contradict what Catherine says, but I may give a slightly different slant on it, and that's a good thing, because we actually research slightly different areas, and so you get to see different things. And um, I, I think that the, there is this risk of scientific misinformation, as, 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 as Catherine talked about, and fake news and all, all that entails. However, when you look across the board in Europe in, and even in America where they have a skeptical president but they have lots of action occurring at the local level and state level, we do see a lot of climate action and we do see a lot of support for climate action amongst citizens. So with something like climate change, we actually see that it is starting to have an influence on things. We see countries having um, targets for carbon emissions reductions, um, et cetera, et cetera. With biodiversity policy, we have less of an influence on, on decisions. Um, that's something maybe we can discuss in the round. I've got some ideas on that, but that's not the core of what I, I want to talk about. Because even though, so now this is where I get a bit more skeptical, critical of, of, of how science is influencing the policy debate. Even with climate change, we are seeing it having an influence, but not necessarily an impact. So we often have these targets put in place for climate change, but we don't have concrete policies being put in place, and we don't have support amongst the public for concrete policies. It's often 2050s in the distance. We kick the can down the road, as you say in English, and we will deal with that later on. So what's being missed is the notion, in my mind, of urgency. Um, so in the whole scientific communication, the problems are being recognised, but the urgency of the problems aren't really manifesting in terms of the speed of decision making, but also in terms of how society thinks it needs to respond to this. Um, so there are issues around this which I think feed into some of what Catherine said. So why is that? It's this idea of complexity versus simplicity. We do live in this uh, post-truth politics where we have um, uh, more popularist policies, where you have simple soundbite messages. However, the solutions that we're looking for are complex. So it's it, the co complex solutions and the discussions we need to have around those are actually coming up against this desire uh, and politicization in terms of, of wanting very simple soundbites, simple messages out of that. And it is complex. It's complex because it confronts the very things that we do for our good lives. It confronts um, how we travel, how we work, how we measure well-being, and all those types of things. And public policy uh, institutions uh, and even society and, and market institutions are not really very creative in terms of thinking about these solutions and taking them forward. So I think one of the big challenges for science is how to become more creative. It's Given the message of, I think, 
more effectively, slowly more effectively, it could do better of saying there is a problem. How do we then translate that to urgent action? And I think science needs to think about how it becomes more creative in its messaging there, but also society and public administrations need to be more creative to think outside our current way of doing things and imagine a future that is different. And I think it's got roles for all of these sectors in society to do that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, and um, already many very interesting things were, were said. I, I want to make a, another point uh, about the use of science in, in policy, and it's mostly about fragmented uh, way that science is, is produced and the lack of interdisciplinarity. So that's my point. Uh, for me, one of the greatest challenges is that now the society is changing very, very fast, and the models that were used for economic development, for, for uh, what is a good agriculture, what is a, a good uh, economic development for a country, are changing, are changing. And it's difficult also for scientists to, to acknowledge the change. Uh, Okay, scientists are very smart, <laughs> uh, but they also have limits, and they use models that sometimes are, are not necessarily, um, you know, uh, put um, in, in the context of the new changes. And, and for instance, um, with technology, which is, is changing very fast, but, and also, of course, with environmental impact. Someone that is very much quoted uh, these days is Greta Thunberg. <laughs> and she says, don't listen to me, listen to scientists. Huh? And of course, this is a very big simplification because the scientists, they don't really know what to do. I mean, they, they can have principles, they can give evidence, uh, but there, there is, we need a triangulation uh, with um, with scientists, with, with uh, policy makers, and, and also the public. And it's not just follow what the scientists, because the scientists, I think, they don't really know. There are different uh, visions for every problem, uh, not, not for natural science. I mean, there is more co consensus on natural science. But uh, on what to do about political uh, direction, economic direction, there are many views. and so. There need to be uh, a dialogue and not just following the, these, um, these changes. And often, we, we have this training of scientists that were, um, that were used to, to do their science and then give the report to the policymaker. And if you ask them, well, who is the policymaker? Actually, they really don't know very much. And, and they, well, I don't blame scientists. I am also a scientist, though I am also uh, I have a master in philosophy, so that's also why I have a, maybe this this view. Uh, I don't blame them. It's also the training they had, and also the fact that today, who is the decision maker? I mean, you have political uh, representative, and this is very very important. But we see that the private sector, the big companies, are are having a power which is uh, all the time uh, greater. The, 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 the latest papers on who is controlling uh, the, the raw materials or uh, any, any important part of the economy shows that the concentration among very big firms is always higher. So who is the decision maker? I mean, I, I'm sure in Europe we can have very good dialogue between scientists and policy makers. But it has to include other actors, uh, the, the population, and also uh, economic um, decision makers. So one, one uh, idea to, to go in this direction would be to have more inter interdisciplinarity studies and to, to see that we, we are not only a specialist of, of something which is very limited. And with the dialogue uh, among scientists, uh, there can be progress. And of course, an obstacle to that is the evaluation of the career of the scientist, which stays very much in their silos. And you know, you have the paper, which has very specialized. 
I just conclude with one thing I read uh, recently. It's a, a paper by Nicola Stern and Andrew Oswald, you know Stern, the, the Stern report, and they stated uh, in September that the most cited journal in economics, which is the quarterly journal of economics, has uh, never published an article on climate change so far. And this is not just a problem for economic science. It's a problem for society because uh, the, the, the most uh, important decision, -making, decision maker in economy will, will use this science, and this science has a big hole on, on some topics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. The tool. This is the tool. Okay. This one works? Yes. yes. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, it warms my heart to see this uh, young public that has gathered here to talk about uh, science and democracy. Because we, we know that authoritarian regimes love science. But here, we're trying to find, in a sense, a, a dyadic relationship between our democratic uh, values, our idea of uh, good governance and science. So it goes beyond just uh, talking about uh, science and its importance in, uh, in public policy. Claudia, you asked us a question that was... Want to say it again? In the microphone? What is the biggest challenge of the scientists, of the sciences today okay. in their dialogue? Yeah, yeah. What is the biggest challenge uh, uh, for science in the dialogue with this thing that we call society and public policy? My, my answer will be that... Uh, we do not recognize how individuals behave in the real world. So it's a very simple answer. And some of you may think I'm just talking about uh, doing uh, experiments and see how people react to public policy. But here I'm thinking about this big uh, cognitive revolution that is going on in, uh, in psychology and evolutionary economics. I'm one who is not afraid of, of economics, uh, against economics phobia and also in public policy. So we talk about cognitive public policy. The only thing where we haven't thought enough is exactly as you were saying, that everything we know about the brain uh, applies to regulators, to bureaucrats, and to policymakers, to politicians, for example. So why don't we start thinking about the, their brain, the brain of the decision makers? Obviously, uh, immediately we can realize that like, like all human beings, they think about analogy, heuristics, all these things are not exactly scientific. Uh, they are seeking consensus. Very rarely they're trying to find uh, the truth. They're just There is no demand for this. It's not that, you know, maybe at home they won't find the truth. Uh, and, uh, but consensus is more, more, more important. Now, uh, if we take this into account, then uh, we uh, see the limitations of trying to explain to bureaucrats and politicians why they should care about science. This implies a, an infinite demand for, uh, for science, for knowledge, and essentially no heuristics. So that implies not how individuals behave in the real world, but how we would like individuals to behave in the real world. And the quarterly journal of economics is where we see a lot of how you know, we think individuals should behave in, in the real world. Uh, so in a sense, the model of speaking the truth to power, of trying to get a, more science in parliament, to uh, bring uh, science to speak to regulators, it, I'm not against it, but uh, it presupposes a brain that is not the political brain, an attention that is not the political attention, uh, a level of complexity and ambiguity, which is not the level of complexity and ambiguity. Um, one, uh, one lesson I learned uh, through my research is that uh, we should invest more, perhaps, uh, not perhaps, we should invest more in uh, empowering scientists and uh, at the cost of uh, maybe training them out devising specialized programs so that they understand the policy process in which they operate. And they understand the limitations, the political brains, the heuristics with, with you know, the politicians use every day. They understand what it means to take a public policy decision. That's something that in, in policy analysis we know uh, very well. Um, they have to understand that there is not something like science 
and democracy, but there are multiple roles of knowledge and scientific actors in different types of policy processes. And uh, the roles, the effect, you know, the impact of it, the influence of scientists comes with conditions, and these conditions require to open up these boxes of uh, uh, cognitive public policy, the political brain, how decisions are taken, and then refer that back to how we uh, deal with scientists and encourage them to, to get into that uh, maze of the policy process. The other thing, so the thing I learned through my research is that uh, we can also then make policy accountable to science by creating specific instruments which are devised in order to internalize a preference for knowledge, scientific evidence. So there are, there are many instruments that slow down the political brain, that make politicians and regulators think slowly, like consultation, participation, uh, impact appraisal, po policy evaluation. Uh, freedom of Information Acts, uh, Judicial Review of Regulations. In all of these, uh, we always see these as making you know, regulators accountable to an elected politician or something like that, but there is the role for instruments that uh, make uh, those who take decisions internalize uh, the, the role of knowledge and science. So we should create a science uh, set of instruments that already exist, but we should uh, invest more in making them uh, uh, accountable to science. So in terms of democracy, I think there are many vectors of accountability. One is towards citizen, the other is towards elected politicians. We can start thinking about accountability to the world of science. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, retained two points uh, that I would like to develop further. One, I will keep it for a second because I would like then also to invite the audience to discuss with us about it. And I just propose the first that uh, emerged especially in the second and third contributions, which is this, if I have understood correctly what you were saying, this kind of uh, sectoral approach that science has in identifying the problem, analyzing the problem, distilling knowledge, and providing the knowledge. But in one case, not being necessarily able to associate the sense of urgency for the solution of the problem. This is what emerged from the contributions of um, Duncan. And in the, second, in the third case instead, what you were saying uh, resonated with me very much, which is also this lack of engagement from the side of the scientific community into how the problems policymakers will take actions about it. It doesn't regard us pretty much. Um, in in the, my experience, this um, compartmentalized way of doing the own job within the sciences is uh, one of the problems. So I want to launch a provocation. The search of politicians for consensus was mentioned. What if I would say, how would you comment, how would you react if I would say that there is also, in my opinion, an increasing search for consensus from the science of the scientists themselves who are put into these career tracks where consensus, citations, saying the right thing at the right time, voicing a topic which is of high concern in that moment to society also matters to career making. So what would you think if I would say that the search for consensus affects also the scientific world? Okay, thank you. Um, well, we were very short, we discussed that uh, at uh, a workshop we had with um, some of you at UCL, University College London, in April, and we said uh, if we want to understand how people behave in the real world, we have to understand also how scientists believe in, in the real world. And if we have a stereotypical image of the politician as someone uh, enlightened, rational, looking at the long term, the same can be said of, uh, of scientists. So scientists engage with public policy because of a reputation, because they want to have uh, more money for their institutes. There is nothing wrong about uh, um, lobbying for good causes, <laughs> and uh, money for research is a good cause in general, at least. Uh, and uh, they may sometimes also engage because they're seeking truth and they want to speak uh, to power. Uh, I, what you're saying is simply that we have uh, to be realistic about this. Uh, we can, however, 
model the incentives. And as you were saying about promotion tracks, in the, in the UK, uh, uh, social scientists and scientists are engaged uh, if they can demonstrate uh, their impact on public policy and decisions, even a critical impact, even you know, being able to uh, stop uh, that decision that can be taken by the fast brain of the politicians, then they are rewarded with uh, money to their departments. And uh, so that we, we can use the, the political economy of incentives, but also one of, of emotions, because obviously when I say about uh, reputation, there is a moment where uh, celebrating science, getting visibility for good science, bringing citizens to talk to scientists in parliament, as has been done in different countries, uh, rewards emotionally instead of uh, in monetary terms. Uh, again, I think a realistic understanding of why, you know, we need more narratives of why scientists engage and disengage with public policy. One problem may be that the good ones that should have engaged more with public policy decisions are put off by the fact that they see the ones that engage and they don't like the incentive models that is driving them to engage. So the good ones may stay out, and there may be a non-optimal non selection of scientists that engage with public policy. Um, yeah, following on from that, I also come from a UK perspective where impact into policy making is much more, well, also supported in terms of career development and grant getting and kind of the career incentives academics have to progress. So, but on the other hand, it is also an intrinsic motivation often for academics to bring the findings of their research back to those who can actually benefit from those findings, which are often policy makers. And this kind of goes back to my differentiation between the different uses of scientific knowledge. And if scientists, well, putting themselves out there also carries a certain risk, personal risk, and also to their reputation, to their institution, and beyond that. So by being put into a political use climate, scientists also can start to feel discouraged by being able to, well, essentially face public discreditation of their findings and being quoted out of context, all those kind of risks and dangers, whereas on the other hand, when they can be, when they have a certain reassurance that it's likely to be a more well, instrumental or ideally a learning use of their findings, that there's actually, well, their contribution is actually being valued, that it's at least being listened to, then there is much more of also kind of a personal willingness of academics to engage with the public debate and to actually get the right ones there to actually do have good answers because they have done research on that specific problem. And ideally, the policymakers do take those findings into account. So it also depends a little bit, not just on the incentive factors, but also on the, well, the political climate and the framework conditions to encourage academics to contribute more. Thank you. I mean, just to, uh, to, to build on that, I remember being at a, a workshop where we discussed evidence and policy um, around biodiversity, and we had policymakers there. We had academics, we had scientists, we had social scientists, and there was one scientist who was, who was preeminent in his field, and he did all this research. And it was suggested, look, you've got to go out there with this research, take it out there and go to policy makers, speak to them more, because the policy makers in the room were saying, this is fascinating, you've got to tell us this. He was horrified. It was an affront to his, um, his idea of himself as a scientist. A scientist goes out, measures, records, and, um, and, and then you know, he doesn't get his hands dirty in the policy world, uh, which was really interesting. So I think, you know, when we think about scientists, I think I, I, I agree with the point that scientists need to be broader in terms of how they engage with other disciplines and how they come up with a, a, a broader understanding of the problem they're looking at. And I also think that where possible, scientists should not be afraid of engaging with the public, with the policymaking process. However, I say this, however, we shouldn't, I, I do question whether always we should be expecting them to and whether they are always the best people to do 
this because quite often we academics get stuck in our jargon. Uh, we, we, we live in a, a very different world. And I mean, there's a whole, there are a lot of bodies, including PPL, which act as kind of intermediaries between society decision makers and, and, and the scientists, and they have a translational role. So I, I wonder if we need to think more about this middle layer more to, to, to help get the science out there, whether it's through helping the scientist or, 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 or actually in terms of how those intermediary bodies actually take the science and then take it out into the world out there in a way that still respects the original science that it came from. Yes, uh, I would like to react to your two key words in your question, the question of time, the question of consensus. Uh, about time, uh, well, I'm thinking here about scientists which are in the natu natural science, because there are also different kinds of, of scientists, of course, and, and also different personality. Some will engage more, some will be more in the back. Well, it's human. But if you speak, if you think about natural scientists, uh, often they are very specialized, and they, they, they were trained like this. They are in a, in a research center, which is working on this topic. And I don't think that this consensus, consensus uh, search for them is, is working so much. I, I think you have some tracks that are not so easy to, to change. So I, I see many scientists who are staying in their tracks. And they say, oh, now everybody's talking about climate change. And they, you know, they, they are a bit reluctant about it because they are not in climate change uh, science. But they cannot change like this. You know, if they are natural science, you know, you are, you are a specialist of something and you can evolve, but very slowly. So I see one of the characteristics of natural scientists to be really um, in some specialization and to, to, to be there. But to have time to study it. I was often struck uh, at, at workshop, at meetings, where a uh, scientist is, 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 uh, pro is presenting something, and then they lack something in, in the demonstration. They say, oh, this is something we should make a research about. you know. And so there is not this sense of urgency uh, within science uh, stricto senso. Uh, well, that, that's it. And, and the, the third thing is that, um, for me, um, the, um, you have some, some scientists which are in natural science which personally feel concerned about the use of their, of their, um, of their knowledge. For instance, people, bioengineers who have worked all their life with some kind of fertilizer and then, well, it's, it's not good anymore. Um, so they feel concerned, but often they lack the tools to, to understand what's the problem, because the problem is not only in, in, their, in their field, in their knowledge, which is quite specific. The knowledge is that the problem is outside of it, and to know what to do about it. And, and I, I think that uh, I, I was speaking about the big changes that our society is, is undergoing. And some scientists, like other citizens, are a bit lost sometimes with, with uh, with what is happening with their own knowledge. I know some climatologists, uh, it's, it's quite known that are suffering of eco-anxiety because they, they see that there is no good solution and, and, and they cannot provide this solution. So as a person, they see the limits, uh, but they don't always have the tools to, to, undercome, to uh, go under these limits, uh, above these limits. So this is something that could be improved by, by specific uh, settings, I think. Thank you. Um, I had said that I would like now to open up to the audience. Do you, to start with, do you have questions general for the whole panel? Very welcome. Yes? And now I'm going to walk around with the microphone. <laughs> no, and not this way, this way. Yeah, thank you. It was extremely interesting, so thanks for all the presentation. Uh, my name is Mark Movilla. I'm a, um, a master's student from Wageningen University. Um, and I studied environmental sociology and, and policy. And I have a bit of a, maybe a critical question or challenging, I don't know. Um, 
so like in, in in the debate that we've been we've been having we have um, framed science as a very passive means to something which is a very traditional way of thinking of science I mean from enlightenment and so on and so forth um, so as science is not uh, engaging with the end uh, as in the societal and the political end and that's like the the normal process of thinking about science but then um, in the producing of this means when you produce this means there then for me, uh, not for me, of course, for many other uh, philosophers, I'm thinking about Foucault, uh, that's the moment where science becomes power. Uh, so knowledge is power. Um, therefore, when, when, I, when, when we talk about, you know, it's, diff it's problematic if we politicize science, we need to depoliticize silent, uh, uh, science. Uh, in a way, I, of course, I understand the, the the meaning I understand the thinking. However, we uh, risk to neglect this dominant, this fundamental passage that science is power. Therefore, science is inherently embedded in a societal, cultural, economic, political context that if we forget, then science becomes a passive means to everything. And so I think that particularly when engaging with science for democracy, um, I think that it's important to not only think about, okay, what is the relation between science and democracy within politics? Is it just the, the role of a passive means? Or does science also engage with the end of the political process? Thanks. Well, I think it's a question that deserves an immediate reply from you. I keep, okay. Other questions? Okay, so we we'll first collect the questions, I understand. Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Kurum. Thank you very much for the explanation. So we heard a lot about scientists and politicians, which those, are, I think, are two of the parties that need to be spoken about, but we didn't hear anything about citizens. So you talked a lot about politicians and how politicians are those individuals that are looking for consensus, which is one type of politicians, I think, for sure. Um, but we see it every day right now with Fridays for Future and lots of other movements. We're beginning to have more and more of our stakeholders, especially the youth, that are engaging with science, engaging with politics. But you didn't really mention how they, or sh how the scientific community should be engaging with citizens, also as politicians. More and more youth um, activists are becoming politicians in some way. So I would be really interested in knowing how you plan or how you think this bridge should be bridge as well. Thank you. Take note, because we have also a third question it's coming from Tom. <laughs> Thanks very much for the comments and also for the great questions, because I think uh, my question is in, in the same category. Uh, because I'm a political scientist, so for me, science has always been about power and politics. Um, and my question is, isn't Pandora's box open now? Is there, is there any choice? I think scientists are engaging. Natural scientists are also engaging against climate scientists. Yeah, um, so I don't think there's much choice. It's, it's more a question of how do we educate, prepare scientists to better engage with the role they are playing. And not vis-a-vis uh, -vis policy makers, but also public opinion. Uh, and that's also, I think, uh, <laughs> we have a great soccer, we had a great soccer player, Johan Cruyff, who also made a famous quote. Uh, every uh, disadvantage has an advantage. And the great advantage we now see is that issues like climate change and loss of bi biodiversity are mainstream issues. There is now a chance to engage a broader public with all kinds of scientific insights. So uh, in that sense, I think, I hope, many more scientists will engage more actively and also take uh, a bit of a a yeah, different perspective to uh, the loss it will mean f to them in the, in the sense that they might lose their um, ivory tower position in terms of perceived objectivity. Thank you. Um, may I suggest that we reply to these first three questions and then I hold the fourth questions in the background, but otherwise we risk to not giving sufficient attention to all the questions. I would like all questions receiving equal attention. Um, the floor is yours. 
Well, uh, <laughs> there's so many, so many issues here. Uh, of course, science is, is power. That, that it means for me, it, it makes me think about the science in the world. You know, we, we haven't thought about talked about north south relation. We talked. We had in view mostly Europe or the U.S. But when you look at who is producing uh, science today, research, it's mostly in the OECD, and uh, many countries do not have access to that. And this is also a uh, imba great imbalance in, in, in power uh, due to, to science. What I think is that there was a model um, of progress, which is progress uh, is um, is fueled by science, who is producing technology, and technology will produce economic growth, and economic growth will produce progress. You see, and this is the the, the basic model on which our societies have functioned for decades. And I think that this model is is really flawed today uh, for many reasons, for environmental reasons, for globalization reasons, for problems of policy uh, and uh, the eruption of citizens and for many reasons. So, and, and I think that no one for the moment knows really by what to replace this model. Uh, and it will be something that has to be done uh, together with, with many views. Um, and so this is also uh, one part of answer to your question about the citizens. The, of course, this, the citizens have something to, to say about what can be the new model, the, the model of development that, that people want. Of course, there are, there are different kinds of people and so on. But uh, I agree with what Duncan was said, uh, saying about the fact that uh, it has to take, if we need, if you want real progress or real democracy, or uh, just say, use the word you want about big and good and nice idea, we have to, to be in contact with what people want. And, and then, and now, and then, sorry, and for that, we have to have a dialogue with citizens. It's true that I think the scientists as they are now, they are not so good for that. They are not so good for that because scientists are um, in a situation of working more and more and more like in many uh, profession and they, and they think that they just don't have the time to go to this kind of meeting because they, they think that these meetings will not bring them so much. Uh, but I also think that scientists have so much knowledge about so many things that is underused because it's used only in specific uh, knowledge production. So there could be progress in, in this uh, field. And um, the last thing is about the ivory tower. I think they lost already at the ivory tower, you know. Uh, they, they are contested. They are contested as, as many... Uh, position of powers are, are power are, are much more contested than, than they were so this is also a challenge I would like to just summarize the latter two questions also for keeping track and if I would summarize the meaning of the last two questions I would say the distinctions between scientists and citizens in my opinion neglects that scientists are citizens so there are situations in which um, in your reply um, there is a tendency to act more from the ivory tower and the silence of the knowledgeable one. But there are also scientists like us, for example, <laughs> who also try to bring their own knowledge and expertise into their way of, of acting as citizens, first of all, and therefore engaging more with politics. Is that a good trend? Is something we should encourage? Why do scientists resist it? This will be a bit of a summary of the two last inputs. Do you have a feeling that scientists resist this active engagement with politics? Okay, so I'll deal with the citizens question and then I'll go back yeah. to uh, science's part. Um, it was an oversight on my part. I did have notes on citizens and I skipped over them, but uh, they probably wouldn't have answered the things that you're interested in satisfactorily. So this is this is a good opportunity. Um, in terms of, I think, 
as I said earlier, I don't think we, we, we should be in a position necessarily to say that scientists should be engaging with the public. I think some are good for engaging with the public. I think some are less good. I mean, some scientists are actually socially awkward and <laughs> you wouldn't be the best people to engage the public. And so I do think, again, there's a role for intermediaries, people who are scientifically literate but also policy literate, and they can help bridge that gap. But also there are scientists who do want to go out there and, and do do it, and they're passionate that they found something that's really important for society and that society needs to know. So I think it's a, it's a bit of a, a mixed bag. In terms of citizens, yes, they are absolutely crucial for engagement with science, however we do it. And the most, when we're thinking about the environment, the most important citizens, actually, are those who are concerned about the issue. And we, we look at climate change and we see 70% plus of the population seeing it as an issue, but carry on doing the things that they normally do. And I think that is the crux of, of, of the communication with citizens. But also it goes back down to supporting public policies that actually could restrict some of their activities or at least put a price on them if they are damaging the environment. So, uh, and that can include specific groups like farmers and, uh, and pesticides. But you look at this panel here, you look at the people in this room, we've all been on flights, not just for work, on holiday. We all do things that are really bad for the environment, but we're all interested in the environment and concerned about the environment. So this citizen engagement is probably the most crucial aspect, and then that can feed into public policy from there. As to answers as how to do that, the academic literature, also the policy practice um, e examples, there are plenty out there. Um, I've been involved in public dialogues for part of the UK National Ecosystem Assessment, wh which were fantastic. We gave a scientific input, and then the public came up with solutions. Uh, and so, you know, that's a very good way, but there's still then a blockage. We have a small section of the public. How do you then translate that and scale that up to engage with more the public? How do we take those, those fantastic ideas that the public have from all walks of life, randomly selected, weren't interested in the environment necessarily. Um, they come up with these amazing ideas, they change their way of thinking. How do we translate those ideas into public policies when it's only small samples? So I think there's a lot to be thinking about in terms of how we have that wider engagement and how we kind of counteract some of the trends that Catherine was pointing out against uh, um, uh, false false information through mass media and how you counteract that through, through an effective strategy to engage the public in a way that's meaningful and is really promoting the science. Um, I'm not sure if we've got the answers there yet, but those are the things I think we probably need to be looking at. Um, oh, and yeah, sorry. And of course, science is political. In fact, the whole scientific process is political. But it's not just, I, but I, I don't necessarily think that science is power. Knowledge is power. If science was power, then we would have done something about climate change <laughs> a lot earlier. So there are counter-narratives and counter-knowledges at play which are providing kind of a fake scientific account for something like climate change. And they've got the money behind them, and that's where the power lies, is where the money is, in my opinion. So. Yeah, I can pretty much just agree with what you've already said. Um, adding to that, I think there is, in our debate, we need to make a bit of a distinction between two types of scientists. And it's not necessarily along natural versus social sciences. We got a mix across both groups. But one group of scientists are the ones who are essentially going out there, researching nature, finding that, oh, glaciers are retreating all kinds of ecosystem changes are happening and we essentially conclude, yes, the climatic conditions are changing. And this is the group that points towards a problem, publishes that in high-profile peer-reviewed journals, but then essentially stops. And I think this is the group we've kind of mostly talked about so far or kind of had in mind when talking about it. There is a second group of scientists and I think everyone on the panel belongs to that second category. It's the ones who are 
often but not always social scientists who are researching the social world, the political decision-making processes, the economic conditions, the social, sociological processes, and are becoming those kind of intermediaries starting from the point of acknowledging, yes, there is a natural sciences type problem such as climate change, but what can we do about it? And who are asking how do we get to, through the political decision-making process, for example, how do we get to those solutions? Or who are thinking of policy solutions, for example, putting a price tag on the costs of polluting the environment, like emissions trading, for example, or carbon taxes. That's kind of a policy solution proposal. And with that, they're entering the political process by approaching decision-makers with models, with essentially, yeah, calculations, coming up with conclusions, what might work, what might not work. And in the end, it is those who are translating who are also engaging with the citizens. And this is the important distinction to make. And on the other hand, it then often comes down to a scientific consensus, which is also something which we've seen around climate change by now. I think 99.9% .9 of all scientists agree that climate change is happening. But we have other areas where scientific findings change as time goes on and new discoveries are being made. And policy might have already moved into the direction of addressing a problem based on the best science at the time. But then new scientific findings emerged that actually contradict the original assumptions. And this is where things get politically messy because then you have entrenched interest groups who are fighting for one perspective or the other. And I think the third point there is really, it's about engaging with the citizens. Yes, we are also citizens. And it is about those political movements, the grassroots that are emerging from that. We've seen it um, in the United States. Yes, there is a big challenge around addressing climate change on a national level, but that has sparked movement by cities, by regions, by states to actually become much more ambitious and actually resisting the lack of ambition on the national level by moving forward by themselves and creating big movements. The Fridays for Future youth movement is another big example. It's born out of the frustration of politics moving too slowly and scientific findings filtering through much too slowly to then actually put political pressure on the politicians. And only together is where we can actually achieve something. We need the scientific findings, we need the translation into politics, and we also need the citizens, the public pressure to, for politicians to actually see that there is also a societal consensus to act on the issue and to move forward with that. Uh, three questions, one from uh, Cologne, yeah, and uh, Tom, and Ma Martin, no. Marco. Marco, okay. Uh, these three questions, they allow us to open up the model. We started with the scientists on the one hand, and then I said uh, bureaucrats who are not elected, and politicians, so we have three, three actors. Now they, we, we start to uh, get into a bigger model that gets closer to democracy. I think uh, part of the bigger model are citizens, of course, and also uh, advocacy organizations. And then we also have the, the scientists as citizens, right? We, why, we, we've seen in history scientists who have been braver to experiment on their own uh, substances that were prohibited. We have seen uh, scientists, in a sense, uh, define uh, the law, so they, they can be part of uh, nonviolent campaigns of civil disobedience. They, we, we don't need just the activists, right? Uh, c scientists are also citizens. But most crucial is this notion that uh, we see, as you said, Marco, science as passive, so we, we think about scientists getting into the findings and then they go out and they disseminate. Uh, I think instead the model of uh, uh, evidence-informed public policy is one in which we also have a upstream engagement and upstream opening up of science. Uh, that means that the, the good model of decision-making in an equation is uh, analysis plus deliberation. Analysis is the moment where you, you look at the robustness of the findings and you look at this 
evolving world of conjectures and confutations and provisionary truths that is science. Uh, and then you have the moment of deliberation where you also uh, openly talk about values, judgment, uh, narratives, what we want as societies. Um, I think the, 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 the main point is to get uh, uh, science, science and scientists into a model of uh, value balanced and evidence informed decisions. No one here is advocating for you know, more power to science. Indeed, the language used by, by Marco was one of uh, right to and of uh, science. And on this, again, uh, uh, going back to what you said about uh, Foucault, which is nice to read, and then uh, sometimes we stop and say, what if, if uh, what I read uh, is not true anymore? In a sense, we live in the paradox of, uh, of Foucault. If, if, uh, if, it, if science uh, were king, at the least we can say today, is that the, the king is naked or the king is contested. There are people who want to cut the head of the king. And uh, also probably people will prefer a democracy or upstream uh, opening of, of science rather than uh, a dictatorship. I remember that be before Foucault, uh, the anthropologist uh, James uh, Fraser in The Golden Bow wrote that societies move from uh, being dominated by magic to being dominated by religion, the new magic. And then in the last chapter, so this fantastic, uh, what is it, 800 page uh, book, uh, Fraser says that now science is the new religion. Well, we, this maybe was true at the time. Uh, it's no longer true. We have to accept that science is part of a political process. That process is contested. Um, that, that's democracy in a sense. We should not be afraid of contestation or pluralism or civil disobedience of scientists. All that, that kind of conflict is the good one, is what makes our society pluralist and democratic and not authoritarian. Thank you very much. Uh, we had the fourth question. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your discussions. Uh, my name is uh, Lucas Capil. I'm a PhD candidate in Eindhoven. On, uh, I work on energy storage, actually. Um, and I often hear this, uh, the definition of scientist, how the scientist should be, and uh, it's a kind of a superhuman because it should produce scientific knowledge, provide the technology, disseminate it to scientific publications and to citizens and, uh, let's say, laymen. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, actually, you talked about this middle layer, which is really necessary for, for scientists to do well their job because there are only 24 hours in the day at the end. Um, and I was wondering the role of this middle layer, who can be there actually, policymakers, but uh, don't you think also Europe or a European framework can do something about that? Uh, I think about Horizon 2020, which is uh, the predecessor of Horizon Europe, and there the Horizon projects actually ask interdisciplinarity, and they have also working packages about dissemination, so we are somehow forced to do dissemination, but this is also increasing the cost of science because a lot of man hours go also there. So I was wondering uh, if the burden should be only on the scientist itself or also in the media, for example, because scientists have also a lot of scientific pressure on publishing on uh, scientific journals and we can discuss about if this process is fair or not, but especially for dissemination to citizens, I would really like to see more media involved in that. And what do you think about it, actually? Thank you. Before you reply, there is a fifth question from Marco. Well, uh, the question was about the media, so the intermediate stage. I mean, there's the fourth power in the classical sense added to the, the three that we know from Montesquieu. And in some member states of the European Union, at least, there's a, a law that obliges a public service to actually offer a public service. And certainly having as many information as possible, evidence-based, evidence-informed, is part of the requirement included in the contract. So we know a lot about social media. We, and I, I'm not younger anymore, but we live in a continent which is the oldest continent in the world, Japan taken aside possibly. So traditional media should have 
a, pl a role to play in a way or another. And we don't see too many scientists invited to, to talk to people, or they are invited at 2 a.m. or at 6 a.m. To, to, to brief about the latest discoveries in some countries. I don't know about the Netherlands. But so, not that this is a f the fault of scientists not to want to go to the po to, to TV, but maybe it is, because if it diminishes their standing, uh, going to talk uh, at 1 p.m., perhaps that could be part of the problem. I just want to say that the Netherlands is much of an exception in this, because there are uh, stars on TV <laughs> at 8 p.m. almost every night, and they are scientists, and they, there is a wonderful, I think, media communications dedicated to science in this country. So this is an exceptional situation. Um, I give you a second microphone. Oh, pardon, am I losing there someone? There. I'm sorry, I haven't, <laughs> excuses, I hadn't seen you. Uh, hi, my name is Gabriele, and We've been hearing a lot about this intermediate level and everything, but I think the example Dr. Radelli was um, telling us about before, so looking at the brain functions and how we can understand better society through that, um, as we have it with organs, we can't really think individually about one individual organ when we talk about a successful physiology. So when we also look about uh, to scientists, thinking about a unity of scientists, so an, institutions, an institution would be very important. And so I wanted to ask, what do you think the role of institutions should have in society much more than individual scientists? And an example that comes to mind is the Italian Space Agency that divulgates scientific knowledge to high schools in uh, disadvantaged areas and high schools in Italy. Thank you. Is there a microphone next to me? I, I, I'll start. Franco wants to add something? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be very quick. A uh, quick question about uh, actually other decision makers uh, involved in the process. So uh, when we talk about, yeah, we are policy makers, but they're also decision makers, in, for instance, in banking. And they sway a lot uh, what, uh, well, farmers, for instance, if you connect uh, to the topic of before, uh, do, and also other energy companies and so forth. We don't see a clear, uh, personally as a scientist, I don't see a clear connection where I can influence uh, decision making at the banking level, and, and I see that actually from the banking uh, from the banking sector there is a um, uh, inertia in uh, trying to avoid moving forward with uh, making decisions that are perhaps less prof profitable on the short run. We don't have much time left for this first panel, so I would suggest you to either pick up your favorite question and reply extensively, or giving a short reply to all of the questions. Up to you. <laughs> okay, I will uh, use this degree of freedom uh, to say three key words. One is uh, institutions, and I don't know if uh, uh, Gabriele, uh, Marco, uh, Marco and me uh, have the same idea, but think about it. When I said before about design, uh, um, design procedures, instruments, the Administrative Procedure Act in the U.S., 1946, as just one one provision around uh, section 554, so you have to go, go, go. And you find this, that no regulator can regulate without giving reasons for the regulations. This is exactly slowing the brain, right? You have to just give reasons. And this reason giving requirement over the decades has been interpreted by courts, another important actor, another institution, to mean evidence-based policy, cost-benefit analysis, best available technology, quantitative risk assessment, and then the president and other institution have issued executive orders to say how this can be done. So there is a lot that can be done for, uh, without saying scientists should do everything, which was the question by, by Luca, without them being superhuman, at the level of institutions. But this idea of, of, of designing things that slow down, they make stuff accountable to other stuff, uh, they uh, automatically create uh, rights and obligations, and then courts, at least in democracies, can enforce this. Second word uh, is brokers. Obviously, um, we, we live in, uh, in societies where 
um, there are brokers. Who are these brokers? They are from those who write uh, the uh, press releases of a scientist explaining what the probability distribution is in ways that then the journalists can uh, understand to organizations like this one, like uh, uh, Sense About Science in the UK and Brussels. And the third key word is coalitions. I think if we are hot, if you're warm <laughs> about this, it's time to build coalitions. One of the most important books in environmental policy, one of the few I've read, I'm not an expert <laughs> on environmental policy by Martin Heyer, was about environmental coalitions and how they changed the, the framing of uh, precaution and uh, um, preventing pollution pays. And it was about these discourse coalitions, which means that uh, scientific evidence, balanced values, what the courts do, you know, legal action, civil disobedience, uh, advocacy organizations have to get together and create these uh, coalitions. At least in democracies, it's that is the, the recipe for change is a, a, a coalition for advocacy. In authoritarian regimes, it's your career in the Chinese Communist Party. So we can decide that one or the other are the two channels to influence policy. Yes, I can just um, reiterate and emphasize your second point. <laughs> um, kind of the middleman, the middle layer you mentioned in um, some of the questions, actually. It's about having good communicators of science. We have a time lag problem for the career scientists, the career academics. They're also probably, until now, have only talked about the research part of what they're doing. But often, at least half of their contract actually includes teaching. So this is also a part of disseminating research-led teaching and including the scientific findings into the teaching, which then with the students moving on into policy-oriented careers, but not necessarily becoming scientists themselves, are actually becoming communicators and disseminators of scientific findings. And it's also a very important role for think tanks, essentially, independent research institutes which are working much more closer to policy making, who are actually working with very different timescales in academics for us, between starting a research project, carrying it out, publishing the findings at several years. It's not just one or two years, we're often looking at a two, three, four year time lag. But for those think tanks, policy oriented research institutes, and also well, essentially science journalism, it's a much quicker time frame where they're picking up the scientific findings and then disseminating them to policymakers much quicker in terms of short policy briefs, one, two page briefings, which are much easier to digest for the normal policymaker than the very complicated scientific journal focused jargon, which is its own style of writing and communicating. And in terms of, of that, it's really important to focus on this middle group as well. And as Claudia said, also, it's about the coalitions, it's about those different interest groups. And scientists may start from an independent perspective from the ivory tower, but as soon as they start engaging on a certain political policy making issue, they end up choosing sides. They might be siding with the environmental NGOs, they might be siding with the industry interests, they might be siding with one group or the other often. And this is when they actually become activists and lobbyists in a way for a certain cause based on their scientific findings themselves and are entering this slightly more messy political arena around the different discourses and also engaging with the citizens and sometimes probably more acting as a citizen than as a scientist in the process. Um, I'll be very quick. Of course, institutions matter. Institutions are under attack, especially in Britain at the moment, uh, <laughs> as an example, but, but around the world. Um, and they're an essential facet of democracy, but they're also an essential facet for for actually engaging with the public over the issues which count, and those, and part of that is the scientific dialogue debate out there. So yeah, institutions play that crucial role, um, and we shouldn't lose that argument that inst you know at the moment we see a lot of rhetoric about institutions being bad, but they exist for a reason, and, and, and that reason is 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 to collectively 
push forward social goals uh, and things like that. Um, media, very quickly, is very interesting. Um, I, do, I don't research media and climate change, but I teach it, so I know the research well. Um, we have real problems with communicating science through traditional newspaper media because of ownership issues, uh, where they get their funding from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, and you know, good science writing is very difficult. Public service uh, media, fantastic, um, but again, it's tricky. The BBC in the UK is seen as this outstanding public service provider. However, on climate change, it had it bought into the fact that climate, science, climate change was a 50-50 issue. Some believed in it, some didn't. And its coverage always represented that, but not the scientific consensus. So even with public service broadcasting, you have to really think about what it means to responsibly report science. Mm. <laughs> so uh, I will not develop further the idea of institutions, uh, except to say that there are also to be new settings uh, and new development. But I just take uh, two points. One was that the dissemination uh, phase would increase the cost. Well, I, I, would, uh, I would think about it because, uh, you know, there are so many research which doesn't serve anything and cost something and are put somewhere and never used. And the idea of dissemination is to have more good ideas also about what to do, what, what, would, what is a research that is really interesting and to interfere with, uh, to communicate with the other public. So I think at short term it can be a cost, but I, I would say that at long term or medium term it, it's something that is an investment in my view. And for the last question, well, it's, it's now the conclusion, and uh, I can just propose something. You have science for democracy, but we need also democracy for science. Uh, because uh, who is now investing a lot in research, in really cutting-edge research? It's films like Google, like, like those giants. And they are, decided, they are deciding what they want. I mean, they, it's not the public, it's not the government who are, who are saying you, are, you should do this or that research. So we have to be aware that a lot of science is now, and more and more science is produced in, in private uh, spheres, which is not necessarily a, a bad thing. It, it can be also very useful for society, that's, that's for sure. But all, all our discussion was about scientific, which are you know, in the public sphere. And there are many, many scientists in this private sphere. And I think that the democracy for science should also touch this sphere. Thank you very much. I think it was a wonderful conclusion. Uh, thank you for your many questions. I would like to applaud our panel members. Claudia. Uh, hi, Marco, nice meeting you. So this, uh, this second part, yes, she's working on the computer. Uh, Federica, wherever you want. Uh, unlike the first part, uh, we, uh, I don't know if uh, people by profession are scientists or researchers or experts in everything, but he, they're here in their activist capacity, which is a new word to talk about politics. I'm an old guy, so I, I still believe that some words should still be used, not because they have a higher meaning or a deeper meaning, but certainly sometimes it's easier to talk to the other part of the a European continent that is beyond the age of 65 with the, with the, with the vocabulary that it can also understand. But activism comes from action, and certainly action is what will be discussed by, by now. The, to give another half a minute to, to, to Virginia to set up everything, the European Union has decided to launch a, a, an instrument that will allow citizens to propose, promote ideas or pieces of legislation to be delivered and or sent to the European institutions. Sometimes they have been uh, pro something, other times they have been against something, sometimes they've been out of the 
of anybody's mind and they have been rejected. So people are supposed to write a piece of paper, send it to the commission, have a first yes, then set up a committee or a group of people that are present at least seven members of the European Union, member states, and collect enough signatures to come up with a million signatures. And of course, the number of necessary signatures are counted in proportion with the uh, inhabitants of a member state. Watch out. There you go. Not many have reached success, and some of those that have reached the necessary number of signatures have been rejected by the European Commission. If you ask me why, I would say I was in agreement with the Commission, but this is not what we're discussing today. Uh, because we have to expand aspects of the participation, but we also have to keep in mind some arguments to back up those proposals for participation and action, and sometimes uh, ideology takes the place of science or evidence or facts. So the floor is, the microphone goes to Virginia Fiume, who will be introducing and chairing this panel. Thank you, Michael. Thanks uh, for the panelists and thanks for everyone for joining us today. Um, so my name is Virginia Fiume and I coordinate the European Citizen Initiative supported by uh, and led by Science for Democracy and also I'm coordinating together with Marco Cappato a new project called Humans which is a movement of uh, European citizens um, using participatory democracy to propose a reform of the European Union. And uh, today, uh, what we are trying to do is to work on what Professor Zakai mentioned, is the triangle between science, politics, and public is said. Uh, I prefer the expression citizens, uh, which is more individual. Uh, so this panel is something you don't often see on television because TV programs and media in general prefers to talk about electoral politics and political parties rather than other forms of political engagement. So um, what we try to do today is to give a, an idea of the combination of representative democracy, participatory democracy and, uh, um, and active engagement. So we, we have uh, four European citizens who are promoters of four European citizen initiatives. We have a member of the Dutch parliament, Matthijs Sinot, hope it's correct. Um, we have Colomb, uh, Kain Salvador, who was the founder of VOLT, uh, pan -European, uh, one of the first, the first pan-European political party, and uh, Federica Sabati who is the vice president of the European Movement, coordinator of the political party Pio Europa Bruxelles, and has extensive experience in the environmental um, industry. Um, so what we try to do is, first, we will talk about the European citizen initiatives. Um, since I don't want to steal the time of the speakers, I'll explain you what is an European citizen initiative so that then we can deep dive into the actual topic in itself. Um, as Marco was mentioning, the European Citizen Initiative is an um, institutional tool for participatory democracy provided by the European treaties, which allows groups of citizens and organizations to submit a policy idea to the European Commission, which then can evaluate if these needs can be applied uh, at a European level. And uh, it's a very difficult effort because you need to cover your different European countries, collect one million of signatures, so it's not an easy task and a lot of people don't even know what is an European citizen initiative. Uh, but uh, we decided to give the space to organizers uh, of this type of initiative because we believe it's a way to fill, the, to join the get dots between politics, the fight for climate change, and uh, uh, active engagement of European citizens. So I, I think we can start with the guys. And we will start from Claudia. Claudia Basta, you, heard, you saw her before. Um, she's a great example of how a scientist can also become uh, an active citizen. Uh, Claudia is part of the committee who launched the um, European Citizen Initiative called European, um, sorry, a prize for carbon to fight climate change. So I'm going to ask Claudia to tell us how the committee worked 
on the creation, what, what is the request of this European Citizen Initiative and how the committee worked to balance science and a suggestion for a new policy for the European Union. You have uh, four minutes or so. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, I try to make myself a bit small because otherwise you hear me and see me too much, but now I stand for the three minutes necessary for all of you to see me. Uh, indeed, as it emerged from probably my moderation in the previous panel, I do belong to that part of the community of social and policy scientists who really want to put their face <laughs> on what they study and do research on. And in this case, I um, seize the opportunity created by Science for Democracy, particularly in terms of bringing the people together by Marco Capato, who has grouped a group of professors, um, scholars, scientists indeed, uh, in my case I am an applied scientist, I work for the Dutch government, um, to reason about a possible European citizens initiative on carbon pricing. It was mentioned before. It consists of an initiative that touches upon three points. The first is associating a minimum price per every ton equivalent of CO2 emissions across industries and sectors in the European Union. The second point is to promote uh, the long discussed uh, border carbon adjustment. It's called the literature, which means that not only we want to associate a minimum price on carbon emissions in the European Union, but also to goods imported in the Union. Something which is complex, perhaps the most complex aspect of our proposal, but something that, because I was the one doing the literature review, much agreed upon, uh, where there is a lot of consensus from the, science of, from the side of environmental economists especially. The third point of the proposal will be to use the revenue from what in fact consists of um, a taxation, you could say, uh, to use the revenue to um, help and redistribute uh, to low-income European citizens, whereas for citizens we obviously include all the residents having right to access it. So basically, the initiative uh, brings together an important uh, environmental target, so mitigating consistently emissions of CO2 by means of a market mechanism, using the carbon border adjustment as incentive for importing countries to use similar regulations, so setting the standard, becoming the benchmark in this type of regulation. The third element is to establish a measure that goes to uh, expand the social welfare policies of the European Union. So we would create a fund that redistributes this revenue to European citizens. So it is a, um, a way to, first of all, bring the people who are less advantaged by the energy transitions into those people who have advantages from the energy transition, instead of only being the loser of the technological transition, but also for the very fact of being European citizens and residents. Um, we worked on this coordinated by Professor Alberto Maiocchi, whom I have to cite because he is a professor of public finance and without his in-depth knowledge, I myself would have not been able to tell you the past two minutes of description of the initiative. And um, we work like reasoning as the triangle of uh, Professor Zakai was saying. So in my case, for example, I'm not an expert in the field. I obviously, as any trained scientist, good in peer reviewing and, and selecting and identifying questions open, etc. But I have no skills for translating this into a short language that would come down to Europeans initiative. And for that, for example, Marco Capato, Andrea Salimbeni and others were key because they were able to translate a huge scientific problem into six lines of a European proposal, because the um, European Initi Citizens Initiative is a very short text in which you set a policy target. So do, don't enter into the details of how, you just say, this is the regulation we need, justified by this, the scientific evidence is that. It was a great experience for me. I really, um, yeah, it's nearly emotional speaking about it because I've learned in those months far more than I've learned probably in many other situations of my life. Um, but that's all I have to say, I think. I use my time. Thank you, Claudia. Um, one of the beauty of this path in the European Citizen Initiative journey is that we met other 
promoters. And it's fascinating to see how collaboration can foster uh, a vision for, for fighting climate change. So the closest vision to the Carbon Pricing Initiative is the Ferozen campaign. Um, and the, the speaker is Timothée Galvere. Galvere. Galvez, okay, <laughs> merci. And uh, Timothée is, the, is a student, uh, and this initiative started among European universities, so it's another interesting perspective. Can you tell us again how you came up with the idea from a scientific perspective, but also how and why the committee decided to, to kick off this? Uh, is it working? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, I've heard for the first time that uh, kerosene was tax-exempt uh, in the EU back in November, because it was one of the main uh, claim of the yellow vest. Why do you increase taxes on car fuels if airlines don't pay any uh, fuel tax? And uh, yeah, it started like this. And I asked a few friends, hey, would you be interested in joining this adventure? And uh, thanks God, a few of them were interested in helping uh, from Maastricht University. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a very uh, student-led initiative because we didn't receive any funding or help of any NGO, so it's really a uh, citizens-led European citizens initiative. Um, now, to bridge the gap with the, with the science, uh, there was a lot of literature on this issue, because uh, even though aviation pollution is a bit taboo, I have to say, I, like, before the whole flight chain movement, I very rarely could listen or read things about how polluting uh, air travel is. But now it's really entering the public debates, and it's good because it, it's really making me realize everyone that, yes, taking a plane is, is just the most carbon-intensive mode of transport, so we should try to avoid it. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of uh, literature on, the, on this issue. Uh, many, many uh, campaigners and uh, lobbyists working, on European, working at European level already wrote things on this, on this issue, especially transport environment, for those who know but also Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth. So there was a lot of uh, scientific evidence that this is an issue that we need to address because aviation emissions are skyrocketing. It's plus 5% per year just within the EU. And uh, yeah, it was very easy to find uh, scientific evidence of what was need needed to do, what was needed to do uh, with the revenues from the tax, and uh, that it was an emergency because if we don't do anything, uh, air travel pollution is going to double within 20 years. Um, so yes, that's pretty it. So I almost forget that we also have an audience online. So do you want to share with the audience in the room and with the audience online the website to sign? Because we need the signatures as yes. well. So. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, so the website is called Ferrosin, F-A-I-R-O-S-E-N-E. -E. It's just fair plus the end of kerosene, because we want to make kerosene fair, because again, it's not only a problem of climate injustice, it's also a problem of social and fiscal injustice, because why should only car drivers pay fuel taxes? And for the Carbon Pricing Initiative, uh, stopglobalwarming.eu is the website to sign. So we, for the guys, just remember to mention it. Thanks, uh, Tim. Um, so the third one, uh, we have Thomas Heitzenberg, who has many hats, even if you don't see them. So first of all, he's one of the campaigners who actually worked on the development of the European Citizen Initiative tool, but also uh, is a member of Scientists for Future and Friday for Future, as an activist of Fridays for Future. And in the past weeks, Fridays for Future launched its own European Citizen Initiative. So I'm very glad to hear from him uh, how you transform uh, the ideas of a movement somehow into an institutional type of, uh, of request to the democratic institutions and, how, and what you ask. Slowly. <laughs> uh, well, Fridays being a movement always was very reluctant on, on coming up with specific goals, uh, getting engaged with politicians into discussing measures is something that Fridays doesn't want to do. For the simple reason that whenever we tried that, politicians told us this is not possible. And we said it might not be possible, but it is necessary. So, uh, being caught in that, <laughs> we had a lot of discussions. Uh, after some analysis, we came up with, well, there is on national and regional level a lot of activity happening by Fridays. We are pressuring all those politicians. Uh, 
we have quite strong lobbying with Creta on international level, but what we are missing is on European level. Like there is no Fridays for Future activity uh, targeting directly the Commission or the Parliament uh, in Brussels. So uh, we finally agreed on that taking an ECI and uh, trying to formulate something that is within the understanding of Fridays for Future would allow us to create pressure on European level by running an ECI. Uh, the goals that we came up with are uh, not as that specific as the other ones. Uh, the goal number one is, uh, with best regards to the new Commissioner uh, von der Leyen, 2050 is by far too late. So we demand net zero in the EU till latest 2035. Uh, and we're not discussing whether it is possible. We simply say it's necessary. And it is necessary for two reasons which are widespreadly not known. Number one, the IPCC report is only based on linear effects. It is by default and by permission of the ordering politicians not allowed to include non-linear effects, all the tipping points, all the things that really matter in the future are not included in the IPCC reports forecasts. Number two, the Paris Agreement does not provide a safe haven. Even if we comply with the budgets that are granted by the Paris Agreement, it is not 100% sure that we will stay within the 1.5 or 2 degrees limit. It's a 66 <clears throat> a 66% chance. So what we are actually doing is we are gambling with the future of our generation, of our future generation and of our planet by saying, well, 66% is good enough. And this is not. So goal number one is 35 net zero within the EU. Number two already mentioned, border carbon adjustment, meaning protecting the transforming European industry while moving to carbon zero and asking all the other countries to pay the fair share if they don't follow us. <laughs> number three, no more free trade agreements with, com uh, with countries that do not follow the Paris Agreement. So there is no TTIP. <laughs> yeah. uh, number four, providing free material for all countries in the EU in all languages to allow the training and, and uh, presenting the effects, the causes, and potential measures against the climate crisis. Now, these four sounds a little bit more general as the other ones, uh, which is true. Uh, still, it is a first set of demands that we present the new commission to make sure they cannot pass their initiation with the Green New Deal 2050, because it lacks the ambitious uh, movement that we need to have within Europe. We need to be more ambitious, and this is what the CCI is about. We will collect a million signatures as fast as possible. We will rely mainly on Fridays for Future regional groups and collect that. And once we've got that, we're going to print them out and move them manually to Brussels to hand it over by hand to the Commission to make sure the young people, and my nickname is I'm the old child, <laughs> uh, the young people really demand a solution that ensures their future on this planet. Yeah, and the website is eci.fridaysforfuture.org. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Basically, if you put together these three and the next one, we have a shadow cabinet for team members for the, for the, new, the Green Deal thing. So if we join efforts, we can be super powerful. Um, so the last but not least is Martina Heimlinger. Something like that. Okay. Uh, she's the coordinator for the Growth Scientific Process Initiative. Uh, compared to the others, is a different angle to tackle the climate change is issues. Is about uh, uh, efficiency in ag agricultural practices. I will let her explain better what it means and tell us also about uh, the scientific evidences in a controversial field or apparently controversial. So. Let us, tell us more, please. <laughs> so first of all, thank you also for the introduction and the invitation to participate in this panel. Um, so I will start just by explaining how we started this initiative and by that also answering the questions that you just posed. Um, so we are also solely uh, student-led. We were a group of nine master students 
uh, and as such we've analyzed the EU laws on agricultural innovations, in particular new breeding techniques. So uh, just to be very clear in, uh, on this term, those are techniques where you can very precisely uh, introduce new traits into plants and they are um, the, the products of these techniques are still uh, most of the time indistinguishable from what could be reached with uh, traditional breeding techniques. Uh, so the, the whole idea of our initiative is basically uh, to facilitate uh, the regulations on these techniques. And I will explain to you why this is important uh, in three points. So first of all, the, the potential of these techniques is uh, simply uh, striking. There's a lot of scientific evidence and also scientific consensus that these techniques have a lot of potential in fighting um, uh, issues like uh, climate change or uh, helping in making plants more resilient to uh, the, uh, the consequences that we already see that climate change has. Um, so uh, scientific evidence is really uh, exploding. There's so many um, research areas going on in, in very many plants. Uh, just to mention a few, so there would be, for instance, uh, uh, a maize that could be uh, could could uh, grow at higher yields on the same amount of field, uh, but then uh, since you have a higher yield on the same uh, same size of field, you could potentially uh, decrease the, the uh, non-arable land that you would have to uh, convert into arable land, uh, meaning that uh, by reducing this amount of land that you uh, need to produce the same amount of food, uh, you could potentially save a lot of emissions or also uh, uh, keep the potential up of um, uh, yeah, uh, sequestering carbon or also uh, fixing carbon in those uh, areas that you don't convert into arable lands. That would be only one example, uh, but there's a lot of different examples where you can also use these techniques to make crops that simply use less resources, for instance, less water, which is also a, a very important aspect when it comes to environmental considerations. Um, so there's simply a lot of potential in these techniques. But uh, the, the big issue uh, in the EU is that they are regulated really stringently. Uh, and this is uh, since a uh, court ruling, which was uh, passed last year, uh, which decided this, that these new breeding techniques, even though they do not involve species, foreign genes, or the introduction of uh, foreign genes into the plants, are in principle to be considered just as strictly as GMOs, so genetically modified organisms. And the regulations on these are simply so strict that this has led to um, a, a really an implicit ban on them. So there's only very, very uh, few approved uh, plants in the EU right now. And only uh, Portugal and Spain are, are uh, at the moment growing GMOs. So that's a different debate. But we, uh, as an initiative, want to now show that there's a difference between conventional GMOs and those products that can be achieved with new breeding techniques they're based on, on, uh, on a very certain type of, of uh, trait uh, uh, enhancement. Uh, and yeah, so that, that would be the, the point of our initiative. And what we ask in this initiative is not uh, mainly four goals or three goals, but we have really set up a, a legal proposal, which is really detailed uh, and uh, actually uh, is supposed to amend the existing law that is there in a way that there's a better balance between the agricultural progress that we've seen over the past year versus how they are allowed in the EU, a better balance between yeah, innovation and safety. So of course we want to safeguard the life of, of humans, of the environment. Uh, and I think we've tackled that in our, in our um, proposal, in our legal proposal. And that's mainly the point of our initiative. And the website? Oh, the website would be growscientificprogress.org. Thank you, Martina. So now let's move from the other side of the spectrum, which is uh, the representative democracy. We have Matthijs Sinot. Your, your surnames are super difficult for me. Uh, <laughs> so, oh, it's, it's excellent. Oh, thank, thank you. you. So Matthijs is a member of the Dutch parliament uh, with the party D66, which probably in Dutch is said differently. Uh, and we had a very interesting conversation about how carbon pricing is becoming an actual policy in the Netherlands. So I'm interested to understand, we, and I think we are interested to understand how it works to work on, a, on, on an issue 
like carbon pricing, which involves uh, taxation, the use of revenue, and uh, how it becomes a policy. So how you move it from politics to policy. <coughs> yeah. And, and with the, the role of science in this as well, of course. <laughs> yes, okay, okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you for your question. Um, in the Netherlands, we have been discussing uh, a lot about a climate deal uh, over the last year, uh, together with uh, nearly uh, 200 organizations. Uh, it, was, uh, it was led by the government, and there were five sectors where, where we intended to uh, reduce our carbon, uh, carbon emissions uh, by half. So 49% that is to be specifically. Uh, not enough for you, I know, but but in the Netherlands it's already a steep uh, step up. So what was done was, okay, we need to have a plan in order to meet this goal. How are we going to meet that goal? And for you I say, on a European level, uh, the Netherlands is striving for 55% in 2030. So, so we are ambitious in terms of uh, well, previous governments who actually reduced the budgets for climate. So, so that's nearly impossible to, to comprehend that they reduced the, uh, the budgets, but they did. Uh, and there we are, uh, we are now in the coalition uh, with the Democrats, D66, together with uh, the, the conservative liberals, uh, the Christian party, uh, two Christian parties, actually CDA and Christian Union. And together, we had a lot of discussions how, how are we going to meet the goals specifically in the industry sector. And uh, what, what came up in the, in the negotiations was we need to have a carbon, uh, carbon tax. But the industry said, not going to happen. We already have the ETS, the emission trade system in Europe. So that's enough. If we just follow that line, we'll be there. We do enough. Leave us alone. That's basically what their, what their position is. And uh, we really needed to work hard, and, and that's where science came in as well. Uh, at first, the industry parties uh, came up with a, with a system that, um, that just didn't work out if we, if we took a close look scientifically. And that was done by the, by the Dutch uh, planning uh, agency for the, for the environment, PBL. And they said, the industry is not meeting half of its target with this system. So you need to do more. And that basically helped, uh, helped our case to strive for a, for a more serious carbon tax. It, it, it really did. If, if we hadn't had the, the PBL, so the scientific insights, we wouldn't have had the pressure together with, uh, uh, with the pressure from, from society. Uh, so we had scientific pressure, we had a lot of societal pressure, pressure to, uh, to meet this goal. And then, finally, uh, we got the Minister of uh, Economic Affairs. Well, he, he was, he was uh, willing to, uh, to, to make the step. And, uh, and now we are going to have a carbon tax for the industry, locally, so only on a national scale which is a uh, very, very, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little proud of it because we are the only one in the world, the only country in the world that is going to introduce such a carbon tax. There is no other country in the world where there is a carbon tax for the industry. The industry is always uh, counted out. So that's the good thing, but I hope we can soon have the law, because it still needs to be uh, passed as a law, that, that will hopefully uh, happen next year. But then I hope that we can soon skip it and have a much more ambitious European, uh, European uh, uh, carbon tax, because that's actually the way forward. So I'm very uh, curious about your, uh, your uh, <coughs> uh, initiative. I think it's great. I think it's great to have uh, on a European scale all the all the big uh, uh, big companies here say we need to do it on a European level at least because we we compete internationally. Well, that's where your system comes in. And if we would have that, I would love to to skip our law and and and, and trade it with your system. But at this stage, our system is a step forward, and we can hopefully lead the way to a better system. Thank you, Matthijs. So I expect you at the table outside to sign the European Citizen Initiative on Carbon Pricing. Uh, so last, no, 
two last, so Colombo. Uh, you founded a new political party, it was a couple of years ago, if I remember correctly. And uh, so you, you had to come up with uh, a platform of ideas and uh, proposals. Um, once we spoke about the mapping of politics that Volt, Volt developed, and it stuck to my mind as an interesting approach on how to merge uh, evidences, best practices, uh, and at the same time in having a clear political vision. So can you tell us a bit about how Volt developed uh, its own political platform with a very strong scientific approach? With pleasure. <laughs> um, so basically, just to give you a bit of background, we decided to found Volt um, the day after Brexit. Uh, so we realized after Brexit that there was no, I'm French, with an Italian and a German, there was no political party capable of representing us and our common interests at the European level. So you had groups, and the closest one that came to a European party was the Greens, obviously, with different branches but no one had a common program, no one had common policies, and we were talking about common problems at the European level. Um, and then there was a second problem, I'm young, I'm a woman, I'm French. Before being able to have a voice in a French political party, I could have waited many, many, many years, and I don't really like to wait a very long time, personally. <laughs> and so we thought, okay, so it's very hard for young people across Europe. My country is, I think, one of the very hard ones, but I'm gonna make a generalization and say across Europe, to get involved in politics, so let's also change the way we do politics, because just changing you up would be too easy. Um, and let's make sure that citizens can actually participate. And not only participate by voting, but by creating policies, by participating with their local best practices and with their own knowledge. And so we decided, okay, let's create votes. And from this point on, it got a bit more complicated, because we realized very quickly that we had to not only enable everyone to be able to create policies, but also manage to safeguard it somehow. Because if you look at political parties that were created, and enabled direct voting by members, some of them went very badly, very, very quickly. So it's the case of the far-right party in Germany. It didn't start as a far-right party. Um, it started as an anti-euro party, um, and once anti-euro said, lots of members arrived, okay, we also anti-migrants, anti-everything, and it went a horrible way. I come from a human rights background. I was extremely, extremely scared of this. And so we decided to lay down fundamental values in the party that every member had to respect in creating policies. Those fundamental values are the respect of human rights, um, the fact that we believe in science, um, sustainability, and the respect of others. They might sound very basic. Uh, it was 2016, Brexit happened, Trump was about to get elected, Le Pen was going up in France, didn't, it wasn't so basic at the time. And it's still not so basic today. And so we decided, okay, so any member who wants to create a policy has to comply with the fundamental values, but that's not enough. Someone could respect our fundamental values and propose policies that have absolutely no sense, could not be implemented, and would go a terrible way. And so we thought, okay, let's add scientific evidence into this evidence in general. So any policy has to respect our fundamental values and scientific evidence. But scientific evidence, as we also described before, can be interpreted also in different manners, can be, although there tends to be consensus on certain issues, on others, Consensus doesn't exist. And so we added a third check, which is best practices. We don't pretend to reinvent everything. Lots of stuff have been tested at the local level, at the national level, and at the European level, and in other continents that work. So you talked about a bit about a carbon tax. A carbon tax was tested in British Columbia in 2008, I believe. And it worked really well. Within a year, I believe, it reduced carbon emissions by 15%, um, and compared to the rest of Canada, by 16.5%. And at the same time, the, GB, the GDP actually um, augmented because they reinvested the proceeds from the tax into green projects and into helping vulnerable groups. So that's just one of the examples. Some localities, nations, or regions as a whole manage to implement really good policies. We see it works. And so let's use that. And then you have other examples which are a bit more complicated. I'll give you one. UBI, the universal basic income, is a big topic in Europe. It's completely failed in many countries, including in some Nordic countries. And in some, yeah, they actually had to stop it. And it didn't, I, I think it was Sweden, but I'm not 100%. Finland, yeah, they actually had to stop it last year because it didn't work well. In India, in some states, it worked really well. And it's been ongoing for a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting, right? How best practices can vary from country to country. Um, and so with this in mind, we started a process that has evolved through uh, the last two years but to enable every member, and we now have um, 
a couple of thousands of members, but over 60,000 people in the movement to participate in policy making. So any citizen or any person, they don't need to be citizens, that are either living in the EU or have a strong interest in the EU um, can propose the policies as long as it meets those basic standards. Um, for now, we attracted people that tend to have, I would say that don't, for example, not believe in climate change or whatever. So the evidence is more or less agreed upon. I'm sure someday we will have discussion about whether something is really scientific evidence or is not. It hasn't been the case so far but it enabled us to create a platform of policies of over 200 pages, a European program for the European elections that actually elected one member of the European Parliament, um, and that was common in all countries based on facts, on science, uh, and on best practices, every single one of our policies. And it works very, very well, because every time I say, yes, we're based on science, we have lots of footnotes in our program, you can verify all of the facts, there's lots of really heavy reports supporting it. The first thing I'm told is, but this is very, very boring who is going to vote for you? <laughs> Which, at first, I, I mean, I, I come from a legal background, so I like footnotes, I like all of this. I understand that it, it's not necessarily the case for everyone. Um, and I was a bit scared about this, but it actually enables us as a political party um, and as citizens to have much better discussions uh, when talking about politics. So we, we are present in over 300 cities and we do meetups all over Europe. And in meetups, you obviously have people that come to confront you, others that agree. But in any discussion, from the moment you, you can say, okay, it's not only that I believe that climate change exists, that I believe that we should do something urgently, but it actually works. Look at British Columbia, and it will actually enable you to grow your GDP as well. Then it's a whole other conversation, because it's not only about believing in, in, in science and in the scientific evidence, it's showing that it has already worked, and it works for people. So that's how, I'll stop it here, because about policies I can go on forever, <laughs> about how we created them, but that's how we managed to ally science, best practices, and policies. It's an ongoing process. We're learning as we're going. We also apply this by comparing how others do it, NGOs, political parties, and so on, and incorporating those learnings into our programs. Thank you very much, Colomb. Um, and, and now we have Federica Sabati, uh, who is another of many... Yeah, pronounce the name. Uh, nice <laughs> one. Nice one. <laughs> it's been ages that I try to improve my Sabati <laughs> thing. <laughs> So, um, Federica is the Vice President of the European Movement and the coordinator of Pure Europa Bruxelles uh, and also has an extensive experience, as I said, in the um, environmental industries. So, uh, my question is a way to wrap up a bit the previous panel and this panel. We are in a situation where there is an official urgency around fighting climate change and tackling environmental issues and it's a bit in between the pressure from... Uh, the populations and uh, politics uh, is starting to to really get engaged into this. So how do you, how do you saw in the past seven, eight years uh, this process happening uh, and what do you think is essential now to really have actual policy changes? Yeah. At European level, maybe starting from the European yeah, level. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think my, my uh, perspective is, is indeed more, more at European level um, than at national one, although, of course, the two, the two are, are very linked. First of all, the issue of climate change or environmental policy first and, and foremost is not bound by national borders. So I think the natural way to tackle it, it's, it's obviously at European level. Um, so I, I very much you know, agree with you that you know, national uh, Dutch policy would then make sense only if there is then an, a higher or larger uh, policy that is similar at European level because you know, the, 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 the climate doesn't stop at the Dutch border and then starts uh, at the German in, in, a, in a different way. So I think the, the European level one is is the one to uh, the, the right one, at least at the continent level. Um, just one step. I mean, of course, now the 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 ambition has to be higher. But just looking in a in a historical, short historical perspective, I must say that uh, what has been actually activism, Fridays for Future, and everything else uh, linked to it has actually. Uh, moved a lot the political scene in Brussels as much as much as I've I've seen it. Uh, so you know, seven eight years ago, uh, it, the, the, this uh, this uh, uh, climate discussion was still limited to maybe green parties, 
but uh, if you if you listen now to the whole of the European commissioners uh, designate, this is the topic. And I think that indeed the, the climate change topic will be the defined environmental topic in general will be the defining issue of this legislature at, at European level. Um, just these intermediate uh, energy goals of for 2030 down 55% uh, that have been mentioned now by uh, Commission President von der Leyen are, uh, uh, you know, they were at 40% until now. And to arrive to that 40%, there was a huge legislative process to arrive at that uh, with big infights between the European Parliament and the member states and the Commission pushing. And finally, a very fought uh, target was agreed uh, at 40%, but it wasn't a given. Now, the Commission President arrives and it, uh, and immediately says, you know, sorry, 40% is not enough. We need to go to 55%, 50, 55% 55 in, 20, in 2030 already. So just to put a perspective into the fact that it's, uh, yes, the ambition level has to grow and, and has grown, but it's not a given. And, and I think uh, the activist participation, the population participation has contributed a lot to defining what policy is now, is now uh, going to make. Um, one, I think, if I have to mention one of the big hurdles, of course, for policymakers, uh, you have an instrument and that's policy and you want to make continuously new policy. One of the problems that I see is that the policy at European level already exists and is actually not really implemented. Uh, so there's policies for energy efficiency, there's policies for uh, the energy performance of buildings. Building sector is one that I know be uh, better because that's, that's where I work. Uh, these standards exist already, but they're just simply not implemented at national level, uh, or not enough, or too late. So I think starting already from implementation is one of the big challenges that uh, activism, I think, needs to push, because some instruments already exist. Um, and uh, so the, 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 there's a role for, for policymakers to implement at national level what, is, what has already been decided at, at European level. Um, there's a role for, I think, science and technology developers in finding the solutions, particularly in the field of climate change, in finding the, the technical solutions that we need. I mean, one of the big issues on energy uh, is energy storage. I was talking with, where are you, over there, um, earlier. I think this is one of the big challenges uh, for uh, for the energy transition, how do we store uh, intermittent production of uh, renewable energy? How do we store it in every little, in every house, in you know, at, at every point uh, in time? And and that's where science and technology has to give the contribution. Uh, you know, how do we produce batteries in a sustainable way that actually costs so much that we can all use them? How do we have? How do we install the technology that actually already exists, but it's so expensive that not every family can put them in their house how, how do we you know bring you know develop the technology and then bring it in every house that's uh, that's one of the the challenges and then for me the other challenge uh, um, that we need to realize from the action to to from bringing the action from the street into our own life is how are we we, every single one of them, going to be changing our behavior our daily behavior so that we actually are implementing what we are calling for. I was uh, actually was a candidate for the European elections uh, in this uh, in this last uh, in this last uh, tour and um, and I, I've, I've uh, one of the you know the typical questions that I would get only from students was what would be the you know what would you do for the climate or what is your party doing for climate change and this was only students asking me this uh, any other any other uh, audience was was never interested in this but then uh, I went into, I was invited once at uh, some student's house, and so I'm standing there with 25 uh, students, really interesting discussion on, on you know, from, from the ideals uh, to, to how to bring uh, things in, 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 in their own life. And, and of course they had prepared a really nice uh, aperitivo for me, and, uh, and, and everything was, you know, we're in Italy, so food is important, and drinks and nice wine. And, and then and then they asked me, okay, but the environment. And then the tables was completely covered in plastic uh, cutlery, glasses, plates, and so on. So I think I have, 
you know, and there I had to say, look, do you realize that we all need to start changing our behavior? And of course, these plastic cups, your student, they cost less than other things. But maybe, you know, there's, there's this, this uh, responsibility that each of us has that I think is necessary, still is still, is still a challenge uh, that, that we need to yeah, face uh, somehow. Uh, and then there's a last challenge, which I find that is uh, very important. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big issue. That's the international level, because of course what we do in European level is, is great. But now I stopped counting at March, but in March this year, uh, China, only in March this year, China had already uh, uh, built or started building something like 300 new carbon power plants, only in China, only by the, by the month of March 2019. Um, and it's called, sorry, coal power plant, um, and uh, and of course, you know, we need to realize that climate change, as I said at the beginning, doesn't stop at the European border. So, how do we, you know, how can we really interact across our border with the big economies like the U.S. and China, for whom at the moment climate is really not a priority, or at least doesn't seem to be a priority? Um, and that, that's an important uh, that's an important point if we really want to affect climate change, because that's not a European phenomenon only. Um, and and in parallel, and that, that there's maybe a question for Claudia and for uh, uh, for those who are developing the the yeah the the, the, the proposal on the on the border carbon tax is how do you ensure uh, um, so how, how do you make it accountable how do you measure it how do you make sure how to enforce the carbon border tax because that's again knowing a little bit of the China's market uh, that is going to be a, a, a practical issue that has the whole relevance for uh, for and the whole you know defines the success of this policy. So maybe I finish with a question. So let's there start a with a question <laughs> from the speaker to the speaker. <laughs> In the meantime, you can warm up because it's your turn now. So let, give me this so yep. Claudia can answer this one. Um, as I, when I, I will try to Thanks. be as synthetic as possible. Uh, when I introduced the um, initiative, I mentioned the fact that this carbon border adjustment or border carbon adjustment depends on literature is the most complex point because uh, you need to have a globally agreed uh, assessment method, indexing method, and measuring, basically, which allows to assign an, an acceptable environmental footprint to any good, regardless of the point of production. Um, there are scholars who have resolved this by, use, by doing um, modeling and uh, by using something that I didn't know it existed in the first place, which is a global database of goods and environmental footprints data. So basically, they were able to um, assess on average what will be the carbon footprint of every industrial sector and then a reliable assessment of specific goods produced by sector. The point I don't, obviously, the measuring and the assessments um, will always be a problem quantitatively, technically, but in, in my little opinion, it will always be a problem in terms of agreement. How do we agree internationally on using the same reference without every country at national level, for example, bringing the specifics of the own country into play in terms of, for example, the huge differences in cost of production, for example, of uh, specific goods. Uh, should we have kind of a leveling field where we discount that or not? So the technical problem exists. Literature is doing uh, good and fast steps to solve it, or at least to produce models that, from the scientific point of view, are sufficiently reliable. I think the political problem of how do we, um, from the European point of view, for example, impose, in a way, our own standard index into the rest of the world. So what the political consequences of this will be, I think it remains. Uh, that said, I'm not a technically, let's say, uh, um, prepared enough to get into the details of the answer. I think Carlo would have been more useful here. But this is what I can report from our discussions. I come to you. 
Uh, yes, and then we get some questions from the audience, so please. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to uh, shortly respond to your statement that uh, China and, 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 and the US uh, do not take uh, the climate challenge seriously enough. Um, I tend to be a little bit more of another uh, opinion, to be very honest. Uh, we in Europe are only 5% uh, of all the inhabitants of the world, but we pollute for 11%. So we shouldn't be pointing fingers to other, other states. We should be, be taking our own responsibility and make sure it's something that's desirable to have a green lifestyle that's, that's, that, that suits everybody and, uh, and then make sure uh, that uh, China and, and the US will follow. And, and I'm sure they will follow because they've always done so. When something is desirable, people will follow. And I think as a very rich, we are the richest uh, state in the world if you, if you would look at the European Union as one state. So we have the money. We have the technology and we do have the best practices to make sure this thing is going to work. So let's show the world how we're going to do it. I think that's a better way of looking at this problem than pointing fingers. But that's my opinion. Thank you, Matthijs. So, um, we have around 20 minutes to finish and I will take the last five minutes for a last round of questions from my side. But in the meantime, if anyone has a question for all of them, or one of them, that's a good moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the speakers as well. I will uh, keep going on about the carbon footprint tax, uh, because one of the many concerns about this kind of tax is that um, not only you have to take in consideration the willingness or less of other states to implement themselves these kind of regulations, but you also have to take into account the businesses and the fact that businesses are mobile. So as it happens with a labor market, for example, uh, the, the problem is just going to shift to another area of the world where uh, there are less regulations and it's, it's, it's not going to be solved <laughs> just uh, by giving it example, um, even though it's, yeah, uh, it's a good idea. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Okay, who does want to answer this statement, which maybe applies to multiple angles? I, yeah, I don't answer, but I agree. I think I was not really pointing finger, but I think this is really what I was, you know, or at least part of what what was in, in, in the mind. I mean, uh, it's not a question of, you know, I wait for you until you do it and then I will do it because this is, yeah, this is <laughs> simply not happening. In any case, we are, you know, far ahead. But I think you need to take into consideration that we are on the same planet and that uh, as Europe, if you want to have a leadership, and I think we do have want to have a leadership of uh, on, you know, environmental standards, we need to show our leadership not just at home, but in, a, you know, in all the agreements that we do with third countries. And uh, it's, it's not a secret that European businesses are producing, in, are producing in China, they're producing in the US, they're producing in Turkey, they're producing everywhere in the world where there are uh, fiscal um, labor standards that are different or more, uh, or more interesting than in Europe. So to say we need an international approach to an international problem, which is the let's call it the climate change, it's not just this, it's biodiversity and so on, doesn't mean I'm just going to sit here and wait until China does something because they're bigger and you know what, you know, they, no, this is not my point. The point is uh, watch out because this is an international issue and uh, the, the economy is international and if we don't apply our standards everywhere, then it's just, we're not going to be efficaz. What is it? Efficace. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's not efficient, but yeah. Uh, yeah, specifically to your question, if you have a border carbon adjustment, uh, that problem is void. Like, 
mobility doesn't count. If you if you move all all uh, the companies out of Europe, then have to pay when importing the goods of those companies that are then located in China. Uh, there is no benefit for them, uh, and it's it's not. I think it's a little bit of a myth that that companies are that mobile. Companies are not that mobile because shifting everything is very expensive. To a certain degree, they are, uh, but I don't think uh, that every company on that planet will, will move out of the European Union just because we introduce a carbon tax. Uh, because first of they know it is a necessary thing to do, <laughs> and second of they know, well, Europe has its qualities and benefits too. So uh, it's always kind of uh, the same discussion when, when you talk about taxing rich people. They will move away because, no, they will not move away, like especially from Austria, because Austria is a beautiful country. Uh, and there are, it, it's not only about money. I mean, you can say that for every country. Yeah? <laughs> but the point is, uh, those things are sometimes too easy said. Uh, I don't think it's that easy to move like Siemens out of Netherlands. <laughs> Uh, or Dutch, but whatever it is, yeah. Uh, but but especially the border carbon adjustment is specifically there to avoid that, and that's why it comes up with whenever a carbon tax is announced or proposed, you need to couple that with the border carbon adjustment. Notwithstanding that uh, there are some technicalities to be solved. Matthijs. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I. I agree with you uh, that we that we all operate on an international scale. That's that's the basic point of view too, and that was one of the the key points addressed in our in our quest for a, a local carbon tax, a national carbon tax. Uh, so we. As a, as a coalition, a political coalition, the cabinet, we said to each other, we need to make sure there will, won't be any carbon leakage. We don't want companies to pollute somewhere else. We want them to green up their businesses here. So how can we do that? That was the, the basic question. And uh, what, again, thanks to the, 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 the Dutch uh, PBL, the, the planning agency for the environment, we came up with a system where we took we took, uh, we said we, we want to reduce carbon every every year. So the industry has to reduce their carbon every year, and they get they get a free space of uh, of pollution. Let's say that, which is diminishing every year. And above that, they have to pay a, a serious price. Let's say 100 euros, uh, including uh, the uh, ETS. And uh, uh, with this system, uh, we we enabled to keep the companies here and the money we are going to raise, uh, sorry, we are going to subsidize all kinds of new technologies for these companies in order to make sure they can green up here. So yes, they do have to pay taxes when they pollute enough. So the, 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 the laggards, they're, they're, they're really having to have a tough time, but the, the, the coalition of the willing, so so the, the people who are, the companies who are advancing, they actually get a, a, a subsidy to to uh, green up their uh, business, and this combination makes makes nearly sure they won't leave. Why would they leave? We help them. We help them green up their business, and by that, uh, giving them a competitive advantage because the efficiency of their business is increasing. So there was a basic logic of uh, how, how, we, how we think we're going to do this. I hope this answers your question. There is a question in the back. Yeah, thanks. A uh, very small question here. Uh, are you talking about the, the bonus malus uh, regeling there, or is that the carbon price, uh, the second uh, uh, ID that's, uh, that's being used now? Because I, I, I see how it works in the bonus malus uh, version, but I'm not sure if that's still true for carbon pricing. But very simple. Yeah. I'm not talking about uh, the bonus malus. The bonus malus was the one that was, uh, well, killed, actually. So, uh, so and, and, and with, with that, we uh, introduced this system because with the bonus malus, uh, the the malus wasn't too sure, and uh, the the companies could set their own target. Now this was the real problem. If they can set their own target, they're they're never going to pay a, <laughs> a malus. So there was no incentive. But in 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 the new system, there is uh, uh, we we decide how high they have to jump, and if they don't jump, too bad. You're gonna have to pay. But we help you. 
make the jump. That, that's the basic logic. Okay, I'm trying to connect, maybe the question is more for, huh? Lee? Ah, name, oh, sorry. <laughs> so my name is Ligia Paletti. Uh, I, I announce it. So I work for the Netherlands Aerospace Center. So I kind of might think that I'm going against uh, Timothy, but not really, not necessarily. I use you as example. And uh, the question tends to be more to, for the people involved directly into politics. Um, well, I agree on having kerosene tax, they said. People like to fly cheap. People like to buy the plastic because it's cheaper, and then fine, we can tax products, we can increase the cost of the tickets, because that's how a kerosene tax will impact flight tickets, unfortunately. But then we need to change how people purchase things. We need to make sure people understand that the increase in price in the flight ticket is because it's better for the environment. So we've been talking about using the income from this carbon offsetting for helping industries, in helping the business. But then what about using it for education purposes? Because if we don't change that side, like is it something that you're thinking about? Uh, yes, but also like indeed approaching children and the younger generation saying you need to change behavior from the very beginning because there's no point in investing in the industry if then you grow a generation of people that still want to buy cheap. Just to close, I ask my last question so we do a final round and we are on time for Marco Cappato closure at five. So my question for you as an integration is uh, uh, I ask some of you to, to think about a keyword to close the triangle, to imagine how the triangle between science, uh, politics, uh, and activism can be wrapped up together. So I think if we can close answering um, Ligeia's question, but also uh, to summarize a bit the, the entire day, uh, what do you think is the, the way to merge science and democracy and uh, to have an actual impact? So that's a last question for all of you, and let's go into Okay, my word, I don't know if it does all of these things that you say, but <laughs> certainly one of the things that I personally believe is very much linked to what you just said is the word responsibility. I, I maybe as a liberal, I, I truly believe that we need to uh, realize that we are all responsible and, uh, you know, and I would like to be responsible myself also and not have any position uh, that I have where I have not participated in. But uh, I think this is what really uh, will will have an impact if we all take our responsibility as people, as citizens, as uh, you know, businesses, as academics, as scientists to take uh, what, you know to take this fight seriously and really contribute seriously to it. So that's actually a discussion I was having with my friends last weekend, because since the UN speech of um, Greta, it's the main topic of conversation, right? Like, Fridays for Future, what can we do, and so on. And I was talking to many of my friends who are not involved in politics, in science, or in anything related to what we're talking about, and who are more normal citizens, going about their lives, working, studying, whatever, um, and wondering what they should do, uh, and if whatever they should do would actually have an impact. So I believe, of course, in education, in discussing those topics in schools, and in making sure that we're all informed, but I think that this is often used as a scapegoat for states not to take action. And this, so investing some of the proceeds of the tax in education, yes, but I think that shouldn't go, and it's often what I hear, you know, let's push for individual responsibility. Yes, we should all be responsible. We should all not take a flight. We should all not use plastic cups, but it doesn't happen for a single reason. It's complicated, it's expensive, we need to move around. And we can't afford to take um, all of us a boat to the US if we need to go, although it's a great action, we can't afford to do it, it's too long, we don't have the time. Individual responsibility is not that simple, and I think it should be coupled with extremely strong state actions to make sure that we reach even more ambitious goals, and I completely agree with you. you know, Political compromise is complicated, we, get, we take some time to arrive to 40%. It's not enough. I mean, the fact of the matter is, we. The uh, uh, race humans will be raised by 2100 if we don't do better. So we don't really have a choice. And education only is not going to get us there. When you consider that, I think the um, Guardian article said 21 uh, companies emit one third of global emissions. 
great, let's not use plastic cups. I agree. However, there's some bigger actions to be taken on the very short term. It's complicated. It takes time to get there. I think that movements of citizens um, from civil society, Fridays for Futures, and many others um, are beginning to put the state, uh, the pressure on the states, on regions. And um, I believe it's not at all curtailed to Europe. We see it happening all over the world. We see it happening in the US, in Canada, in South America, in Africa, and in Asia to make sure that we actually get there quicker than needed. So education, yes. However, state action for me is the primary point. Uh, yeah, maybe a quick point. Uh, I fully agree with you. Education is key. It's not enough to 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 make uh, plane tickets prices higher. We also need to provide greener alternatives. And I really believe that uh, first of all, we need to raise awareness and uh, hence the ECI to uh, tax kerosene because many people don't know that uh, aviation, the aviation industry, is an, a totally undertaxed industry, and it's. Yeah, very much terrible, but it's not enough to raise awareness. You also need to provide cheaper and greener alternatives to to train to plane tickets, and that's why we propose to invest all the revenues of the tax into into the railway infrastructure. Because if you want to again incentivize those green those greener behavior, you need to to provide cheaper alternatives. You might have said it without even recognizing it. Uh, I agree with 99.9% .9 what you said. There is only two words in it that triggered me, and it's about culture. It's about the world we live in. It's about cheap, fast. We don't have time for that. No time is not an argument. Uh, in the sense of you have not the time to go with a boat to the US. Well, if you don't have the time to go with a boat to the US, there is a simple solution to that. Don't go. <laughs> yeah? I mean, we're talking about of millions of millions of people in history of mankind that never went to the US and still managed to establish families, villages, cities, countries, kingdoms, whatever you name it. So, uh, I think it's about the basic question of our society is culture. We live in a world, in the Western world, where you can buy everything, you own everything, and the planet is here to provide us with everything that we can buy. And that culture needs to change. That culture needs to change into, yes, we are part of an ecosystem and we are interconnected. We are not independent, we don't own it, we should guide it, we should guard it. Yeah. So that brings us to education, because you need education that you can establish a new culture. You need a story, you need messaging, you need all of that. But it takes, and brings me back to, a lot of time to establish that. We don't have the time. So, in order to gain time, we need to act now. And, on the same way, <laughs> tackle changing the paradigm of our society away from we own everything and we can do what we want, to is it reasonable, is it sustainable, can we uh, be responsible with what we got from nature? Because we're part of, we're not the owners. Uh, so, uh, to sum that up, I just wanted to add that one about time. We need to really think about, do we need a new phone? Do we need the biggest phone? Do we need the biggest plasma screen? Do we need a new SUV? Do we need that? Or is it just because it has always, always, like in the last 10, 15 years, always been the way? Uh, it has not. For thousands of years, we have not had the chance of buying everything. And still, the people there had a living. And the planet was much better then. Huh? So, uh, but yeah, education is for sure something to, to, to tackle too. Uh, so the, the main issue for us is how to communicate this to the public so as to make the whole process of policy making democratic, right? Because you want to include as many people as possible in the debate. But how do you make people debate when they don't understand the principles? So it's clear that uh, nobody can be an expert of everything. Um, and so I believe that uh, in order to create this inclusive debate, we need to first invite uh, the citizens who are interested in that particular issue on a fact basis. So to really provide information that is easily understandable for them, uh, to also invite them to give us their concerns and uh, to, to prevent fear with, uh, with facts, because a lot of 
of, of opposition also comes from the fear from people when they see something new, as, for instance, the new breeding techniques. And on the other hand, uh, we also have uh, the other part of the citizens who maybe don't even want to know the technique. It's like the internet, for instance. People are using the internet without being scared of the internet simply because it has an application for them or a use for them. And we hope to communicate also that those new breeding techniques bring about benefits for them, that they can understand uh, that th these benefits by far outweigh all the risks that are associated with these techniques. Uh, and by that, invite people into uh, thinking about uh, how these uh, techniques can, can help them. So to sum that up, um, we also want to get the emotional debate more on a fact-based debate and invite as many people as possible into the debate so as to yeah, uh, prevent the top-down policymaking, but more uh, from a bottom-up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think uh, great things have been said already. Um, the frightening thing is, to answer your both questions, that we only have one generation to make this change. But the great thing is, we've never been in a generation where we have so many technical possibilities to do something about it. And I think we should really strive for that. And, and we won't change a thing if we won't make it affordable. So we have to make it affordable for, for, for everybody to have a, a sustainable house, to have a sustainable life. And we can do that. Um, let me give an example. Wind turbines at sea used to be very, very high in price. But now, the companies who are exploiting them are paying the Dutch a price to, make, uh, 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 to have these wind turbines uh, on the North Sea. So the things have changed. They're, they're not costing subsidy anymore. They have, they have been turned into a, a kind of a business model for the Netherlands. It's, it's, it's funny. So that's a way to make things cheaper. If you really listen to science and all the great things science comes up with, but also the, the, the warnings for the climate uh, change, so, so the urge we feel, but also the great innovative things like electric cars, they're... Uh, uh, the, the price is really decreasing very fast. The same goes for solar panels. The, the price is decreasing really fast. So what we need to do is have a system, a market model, and that's where the government comes in, that makes sure science produces the great innovative things and companies who are really willing are, uh, are going to, uh, to help us make the products and use the products that are actually uh, uh, really low in energy and uh, I I even uh, preferable a uh, circular. And, and that's the way forward, if you ask me. And it's already happening. Give me, let me give you one final example. Uh, the vacuum cleaner. The vacuum cleaner, uh, a few years ago, there was a, there was a new rule and it said uh, that, uh, that uh, the energy efficiency of a vacuum cleaner was decided on in Brussels. Everybody said, that's terrible. Why does Brussels needs to, need to, to have something to do with my vacuum cleaner? Well, I'm going to tell you why. The great thing is, it's reducing 11 megatons of CO2 in Europe the new, by the new rules. Also, uh, the, the energy savings uh, are uh, actually saving us a lot of money, 150 euros in a lifetime of a vacuum cleaner. So it's actually cheaper, it's better for the environment, and you still vacuum clean your home, which is a great thing for a lot of uh, <laughs> sanitation. So it's just one example of the Brussels effect, where if we have strong government setting the right rules and really, really stirring up uh, innovation, then we can do it. I'm going to be extremely short. I just want to say the question from Virginia was what will be our keyword uh, for the triangle that was mentioned before between uh, science, policy, and society. Uh, my keyword is very simple, and it is also an invitation, and it is doing. If you're a scientist and you believe that politicians will listen to you more, go and talk to them. If you are a citizen and you think that scientists are a bit... Uh, impermeable to inputs from, for example, the case of the farmer, go and talk to them. Science for Democracy is a 
group of people who have voluntarily decided to stop going to congresses and putting on the last slide the dialogue between science and society should improve, and they have decided maybe to write one scientific article less, that's certainly my case, but to allocate their time to do what they preach. So doing is really the key word if you really wanna be the next change. Thanks, Claudia. And probably it goes together with citizenship, so I'm gonna, one second, huh? <laughs> No. I will tell you the story of how I fell tonight at six at Schlemmo, where we are going to gather after the event. <laughs> so, um, so thanks to all of you for your contribution, and thanks to all of you for listening. Uh, so in case you want to know more about Science for Democracy, the website is scienceforddemocracy.org. And I am I'm also happy to say that our videos on Facebook reached around 3,000 people, which is great if you consider that, as I said at the beginning, we, you don't see this stuff on television, so that's good. And uh, I will leave the floor to Marco Cappato for closing up this afternoon, and thanks again. <laughs> Thank you, Virginia. Thank you to the speakers. Um, they asked me to close just because they hope that I learned something in listening. And, uh, I just wanted to add one thing about the, the, this, uh, all this uh, environment and the climate change issue because uh, I find quite striking that uh, nobody, nobody at the United Nations debate on that, but usually in the debate on climate change, the the most important factor of uh, um, CO2 emission and consumption of natural resources is never mentioned. And the most important factor is population. So uh, I don't know if this is uh, just a political consideration or also um, the need to uh, explore, to better explore facts because uh, uh, the picture will change a lot if the, if the world is going to 8, 9, 10, 11 billion people or 7, 8, and 9, and maybe then declining. Of course, it's not for tomorrow, but the most important factor of uh, consumption of natural resources is population, and this should be discussed. Uh, and of course, there are, uh, we know that there are religious leaders uh, that they don't want to, to raise this issue, we have to raise it. Um, and uh, this brings uh, to, to a key word, which is Africa, because this uh, population growth is mainly about Africa, is the only area of the world where in sub-Saharan Africa, we still have uh, a rate of five uh, uh, children per uh, woman, and is not a free choice. Is lack of contraception, is lack of, uh, um, of uh, reproductive health, uh, and is lack of uh, uh, information, education, uh, and freedom of choice, lack of freedom of choice. So I think that we should uh, also raise <coughs> this issue maybe through a European Citizen Initiative. We are discussing uh, about that because uh, uh, the, the money, the, the best spent money is exactly the money spent on uh, population control. Um, of course, uh, going to the even to the issue of the of the first part of the afternoon uh, talking about science for the environment and science for democracy we have to be careful not to make confusion science and politics are two different things and uh, to listen to scientists or to engage scientists does not mean that uh, politics have to be decided by scientists or that the political problem and political alternative and choices could be solved just on a scientific basis. Science, science is key 
for uh, assessing facts and also for trying to find solutions. But then the decision is a political decision. Uh, and um, uh, nowadays, democracy is running a very bad time. Is uh, in democracy is uh, in uh, very bad health, and uh, I think that science can make a, a huge contribution to improve the quality of the decision-making process, and. Uh, because the science is very helpful in uh, trying to face three big problems of democracy nowadays, which are uh, the short-term angle uh, of democracy, the national angle of democracy, and uh, the fight for power. These three factors are declining the quality of democracy nowadays and uh, about the national thing has already been said science is a is a global endeavor unfortunately politics and democratic policy is mainly a national issue uh, and this is one factor by which uh, science can help uh, the quality of the democratic process and then short term um, I think that uh, maybe the time will come soon that China will be in a better position to, to propose solutions than uh, our European democracy uh, because they don't have the problem of short-termism of uh, democracy. And uh, nowadays, China is investing the triple, in, as a percentage of the GDP, the triple than Italy on science and research, uh, research investment. And this is a, a huge problem for us, because uh, if uh, democracies lose the race of research, science and technology, then also the political model Democracy is a political model, risk to lose the race face to authoritarian and non-democratic regime. And then there, are, there is the last point about power. Um, are we suggesting that scientists should uh, uh, run uh, as a candidate in the elections and, uh, and do politics? Why not? They are... Uh, of course, citizens, they can do that. But uh, I don't think this is the only solution. And once a scientist gets in the political arena, becomes a politician. So it's not that because she or he is a scientist, uh, he or she should be more credible than other people. I think that what uh, we discussed in the second part of the afternoon, so citizen initiatives, so participative democracy is a tool, is a very powerful tool to allow scientists to do politics without becoming politicians, which is of course a free choice. I'm, uh, I'm not against that. But uh, when we are talking about uh, European citizen initiative in order to propose uh, the things that we, you, you just uh, listened to. Uh, you are not uh, asking for power for yourself as a candidate. You are asking for power to change things. So I think that this is a good way in which, as uh, Claudia was saying at, at the end, there can be an engagement without crossing the line of asking more power for uh, her, uh, himself or herself, but uh, as a contribution to change things. Um, 
I uh, close this uh, conclusion reminding a very important appointment that we decided to uh, create with uh, Science for Democracy. First of all, uh, the whole thing of Science for Democracy um, came from Associazione Luca Coscioni in Italy. Uh, Luca Coscioni was a man ill from uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, and uh, now uh, he died a uh, um, few years ago, and um, he was uh, campaigning for freedom of research on uh, stem cells, on embryonic stem cells. And uh, uh, he succeeded, he couldn't speak with his own voice, but he succeeded together uh, 100 Nobel laureates supporting freedom of research on, uh, on uh, human embryos and stem cells. And from that moment on, with Marco Perduca, we succeeded with a um, transnational coalition to block a move by Italy and by Costa Rica and the OEC uh, for a, a global ban on uh, research on uh, stem cell on stem cell research. research. And uh, from that moment on, we created a forum, an international forum, which is called uh, the World Congress for Scientific Research, um, 12 years ago, and every two, three years, we convened this forum. And it's a pleasure to announce that the next forum will be in, uh, in Africa, in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, co-hosted by the African Union, and that for us will be the occasion to raise a lot of the things that we discussed now, the role of science, the role of technology for development. Let's think about how important it is for the African continent, the perspective of genome editing on crops to resist to the consequences of global warming. So um, there is all the, the population thing that I just mentioned. So the next... Uh, um, appointment for us will be in, uh, in uh, Addis Ababa in February. Um, and so we go back to the democracy thing. Africa is the continent in which uh, the battle between the democratic model and the authoritarian model is more uh, evident, clear. Uh, China so far has been more effective in helping African countries than Europe or the United States. Of course, for their own interest, not for a idealistic, uh, uh, big idealistic reason, but then uh, if uh, 50 years ago democracy was uh, as we say, a weapon of mass attraction, public opinion worldwide was attracted by the democratic model. In Africa, democracy is losing its battle because we are not, um, you, we as Europe, we are not proving able of helping them in the quality of life and in protecting a protecting environment and uh, the, the, the quality of life and the ecosystem. So um, I think that uh, Africa will be the continent in which the battle from, uh, between uh, democracy, uh, democratic regime and authoritarian regime will be fought in the coming years. We are already losing this battle, so something very urgent uh, has to be done. The idea that in one, two, three years, all these instruments of European participation will help uh, to improve the quality of European democracy, I think is, uh, is a key. I will stop with that because um, European designated uh, president of the commission, von der Leyen, had a very good speech uh, saying uh, tax border adjustment, rule of law, uh, social Europe, a lot of... Uh, um, as a reaction of the risk of uh, the mounting of populism and nationalism in Europe. But then party politics and national politics is gaining ground and uh, the vote before the parliament has been postponed and uh, she's not even sure to be 
uh, voted and confirmed as a European Commissioner. So it means that uh, national politics and party politics is not enough. Uh, we need also European politics made through civic participation and I think that uh, today we had an example on how science could be central in, uh, central in this effort. Thank you very much. Stay, stay, stay. Thank you, everybody. Oh, there's a question. Yes, there's a microphone. Yes. Then everybody should get ready to take a, a, a group picture. Yes. Hi, um, not a question, but just um, a comment real quick. Uh, my name is Maya Kashpov. I'm from the United States. Um, I'm studying in Amsterdam. But I just wanted to make a quick little um, announcement about um, these companies I know about in the world. It's called um, Atmospheric Carbon Removal Technology, and I think it's just really important to <laughs> advertise that real quick. Um, there's only three companies in the world that do that, but I just wanted to mention it because, um, as we know, <laughs> removing the car... Or, Stopping emitting carbon, carbon is not going to be enough. We also need to pull the carbon out of the atmosphere. So these companies can help us do that. Um, but it's important not only because they're going to be pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, but they can also make um, carbon neutral fuel, um, which is really important because it can be um, implemented immediately into any um, car engine, train engine, or plane engine that we already have. So there's no um, new infrastructure that needs to happen, and we already have gas station and fuel trucks and things like that available. Um, so we don't need to throw away anything we already have. We just use what already exists. Um, the only thing that needs to happen now is the funding and the scaling up of this idea. Um, and as we know, industries will always um, do what's cheapest for them. So if there is a way to um, get a cheaper resource, that's what they're going to get. And this is important in this aspect because um, as this technology gets scaled up, it can become just as cheap as regular gasoline. So um, as long as there are investors that want to um, help this idea, which actually Bill Gates is one of them, um, once this is scaled up, we can actually start implementing this. And once the industry has the option to use a cheaper resource, then um, that's what they're going to switch over to. Because as we know, money makes the world go round. So I just want to share that idea real quick, because I know it's a little known technology. It does indeed. And on that note, uh, www.scienceforddemocracy.org slash donate to help keep this organization alive. Well, thank you very much. Before we, we go, we gather here to take a group picture. Uh, the co conversation. Uh, yes, no, of course not. We, we believe in freedom in all the aspects. The conversation continues at Schemmel, which is, um, these are not uh, a political direction, right, right, right. So exactly uh, our shoulder. The people that want to take a picture, please come forward. There's, uh, there's free drinks, so that, that helps. Yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> it, no. If you, if you support the Science for Democracy, there are also T-shirts and bags. Uh, there's also a piece of paper where the European Citizens Initiative can be signed, which is outside. Otherwise, at the website uh, of Science for Democracy, and. A photo, I think, is taken by the people uh, with a camera uh, down there, possibly. Anybody else wants to join the picture? It's now or never. Professor Radaelli. Okay, uh, the spe at least the panelists should be in the picture. Come, 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 come. I think we should shrink a bit. Claudio. Yes, yes, somebody, uh, hopefully, yes. All right.